we can see madam can we move one slide up and down okay right so as i mentioned i will be uh, describing the dimensions of healthcare quality and safety and the national quality assurance program so first we will see the dimensions of quality so actually, uh, I, I like these sessions to be interactive. So I need some answers from you. Maybe you can message or even you can raise hand and uh, give your comments or the answers. So to what extent you could understand the concept of quality? Just think about your day-to-day -day life and tell me what do you understand by the quality? First of all, what do you have to realize this? Now you are the, uh, like uh, you're one of the cleverest group in the country, uh, like, you have finished your medical education and now you are going to start your internship. So you have to be interactive. You have to give some comments. Always that will be very helpful for future career. Be active. Can I have some answers? What do you understand by the term quality? Say for an example, you are going to buy a sari. One of the lady intern is going to buy a sari. So she needs to buy a quality sari. So what are the aspects you will be seeing with regards to this sari? I don't know whether I'm audible to the intern group. Oh, are they there? Are they there? Oh, can't I see them? Any responses? What about our directorate team? Can they see any responses from the participants? Madam, we can hear you, madam. Um, can't hear. We can hear you, madam. We can right. hear you. Can you notice any responses from the audience? Um, not yet, madam. So I need some responses to proceed. What do you mean by quality? So I can see 221 participants. So can can we get any answer? What that there are no uh, like right or true answers, so or not only one answer, you can express your opinion. Okay, since I uh, ask about the sari, now I am uh, getting some answers. Very good. So some have mentioned about the... material of the sari, uh, expected standards, quality depends on our requirements, Standard again, then the color. Okay, there are different answers. Very good. So likewise, uh, when I ask some responses, it would be good to give some answers. So all your answers are valid.
the quality depends on the person. So that's what uh, I think you all know this story about these blind people uh, describing elephants. So that depends on the person's, the part of the elephant the person touched. So likewise, quality depends on the person. So the quality is the totality of features of a product that, uh, that bears on its ability to satisfy given needs. So you have uh, expressed that. So there are various definitions of quality. Actually, this quality concept has come from the Japanese concept. So there are certain Japanese terms used in this quality arena. So one of the definition is fitness for use, juren. Or quality means value for money. So when we go to buy that sari, of course, we will think whether it's worth for the money we are spending. Or quality means customer satisfaction then the conformance to the requirement, guarantee of confidence. And quality means efficiency, that is output and the effectiveness outcome. Of course, uh, I will be uh, describing uh, uh, these concepts later. Uh, quality means timely delivery, one of the very important concepts, especially uh, in the uh, healthcare delivery. So let me uh, describe this process so that you will uh, understand the, some of the terms like efficiency and effectiveness. So in this managerial process, there are needs. Uh, to satisfy that there are inputs and the processes. Then there would be certain outputs and finally the outcome. So to make this easy to understand, let's see the example of a patient coming with headache to a hospital. So what is his need? And I have some answers. Patient coming with a headache to hospital, what is his need? Okay, very good. There are several answers. Get relief of pain and reduce the chances of getting it again. Okay, very good. So basically, he's needed to get uh, relief for his headache. Please uh, uh, keep your mics unmute, uh, muted. Until if you want to make any comments, uh, you can raise your hand and uh, mute. I don't know whether uh, the administrators uh, can mute the unnecessary uh, parts. Uh, uh, Sanji Fernando uh, is that on. Okay, uh, so uh, then there are certain inputs uh, in the hospital to attend the need of this patient. What are the inputs in the hospitals? One of the inputs would be the doctors. There are doctors to see this uh, patient. What else? Hmm. 
there would be mid scenes then there would be other supportive staff there would be structures there are those resources we can consider as inputs then there are processes examine the patients taking a history investigations those are processes so what would be the output here i need some answers what is the output of this process now there are inputs like resources then there are certain processes what can we consider as the output here these are some important components you have to understand from the beginning because uh, some of you all especially uh, may need to deal with these concepts during your career so that there are certain answers pain uh, relief of pain and the patient satisfaction in that case what do you consider as the outcome if we consider the relief of pain as the output then what would be the outcome so these concepts may not be very familiar to you here the output can be considered as the now uh, prescribing some drugs to the patients or ordering some investigation come into a diagnosis even we can consider those as outputs the outcome here would be the relief of pain or the patient satisfaction we can consider it as a outcome so is it clear for you all the difference between the output and the outcome for example if we conduct a clinic immunization clinic the conducting uh, the clinic would be the your output but the outcome is uh, far beyond that that is the protection from the disease likewise so is it clear to you all the difference between output and the outcome yes there is one answer madam can we get prescription as one of the input and pain relief as uh, okay outcome can be find the cause and not get getting it again yes so i think you understand the concept outcome is the exact results you got now this patient uh, came with the need of relieving his uh, headache so the outcome is the relief of the headache the in between one is the output when we consider the terms efficiency and effectiveness i think the effectiveness uh, is clear to you that is whether our inputs and the processes meet the expected objective in this case the relief of the headache the output output is the uh, processes and the immediate results of this 
processes and inputs. In this case, we can consider giving some medicines likewise. So say for example, uh, then we talk about the term efficiency, that is the comparisons of your inputs with the outputs. For example, if there are uh, 10 doctors in the OPD and there are only 10 patients also in the OPD, and if it take one hour, these patients are the general OPD patients without much sinister causes. If it takes, say, for example, four hours to see these patients, not the investigations results. So is it efficient? No, it's not efficient. So likewise, efficiency is the comparison whether we have got enough output for the input we spend. So I think we can move on. So those are important concept of a quality health care. So with that in mind, let's see the dimensions of quality. So you can see the effectiveness is one of the quality dimension. Then safety. Again, one of the very important quality dimension. Actually, now we pay more attention for this safety part. Uh, then people-centeredness. So the service we give should be people-centered. We have to consider their views, get their opinions, involve them in their treatment. In that case, of course, uh, it will be helpful to achieve this effectiveness because they are the people who know their illness, their family background well. So as interns, please pay your attention to this important quality concepts. Discuss with patients, get their opinions, give priority to their views. This will help for you all to achieve your effectiveness. Not only that, those will be very helpful for you all because if you are talking with patients, if you are friendly, even if some mistake happens from you, they will not much bothered about it. They will not go against you. So this is one of the key concept, the people-centeredness. Then the timeliness. Again, all of us want a timely service. So even the patients want a timely service. So please consider this also as one of the key quality concepts. Especially this is important to ensure the patient's safety also. For example, if it is an emergency case, you have to attend the patient timely. Even there are some quality indicators. In our general indicators, we have specified the time for you all to attend the patients. So we will be monitoring those. So get the answer to these questions when you, uh, in your next sessions, there would be a session on quality indicators. So you will see how quick, how soon you should see a patient. Then the equity. What do you mean by equity? Can I have some answers? Any idea on the equity? I, I did uh, the same or the similar lecture to the Faculty of Medicine, Colombo, third year students. They gave some answers. So I know that that concept has been taught to you or you know it. It's okay to make mistakes. I need some answers. What do you un uh, understand by the term equity?
Excellent. Divide the resources according to need. Okay. We got the concept. So is there a difference between equity and the equality? Okay, good. There is a difference between the equity and equality. So we'll uh, see that. Then another important aspect of the health care quality and safety is the integration. So uh, here, the service we are giving to a patient should be integrated across the different uh, departments in the hospitals or the unit in the hospitals. Not only that, we should uh, integrate with other sectors where the patient would be going. For example, actually, I spent most of my time in the anti-malaria campaign as a consultant, as a SRN registrar for more than 10 years. There, I can remember many patients used to uh, come to get Prima Queen from faraway places. People come to anti malaria campaign head office because Prima Queen is given as a treatment, second line treatment for a, a type of pneumonia. P uh, like pneumocystic carinae pneumonia, the, from the hospital, they just give a prescription without telling the patient where to go to get this. So they go to pharmacy uh, or susala and they can't find. Ultimately, somebody will tell that this is available in Colombo anti-malaria campaign and they will come. But there are other places, the regional malaria officers, from which they could have get it. So what is the missing part is integration. Ideally, they should get the contact of the places, the drugs available and direct the patient. So likewise, in your career also, you will encounter many places where this integration is not properly happening. So please ensure that you adhere to this important concept. So efficiency we discussed. So these are the quality dimensions uh, again. So as I said, the safety is one of the key concepts. There would be sessions on medication safety and the incident reporting during this uh, session. So you will uh, learn those concepts of safety, but keep this in mind, many patients get harmed during their uh, stay in the hospital. They come to the hospital with one disease, but they may come out with another disease, maybe a hospital acquired infection or maybe some falls. So please take the maximum effort to minimize these uh, unnecessary hazards coming to occurring to patients during their hospital stays. They say that the healthcare is even more riskier than having a uh, like uh, AI travel. They say one in ten patients come into hospital get harmed during during their stay in the hospitals. So the other concepts we described discussed efficiency versus effectiveness. You are clear, I think. Then the equity versus equality, somebody has given a response even to the uh, equality uh, answer. So equality, you can see here the, the three resources, the benches available, they have equally distributed among the people, so one can't see the match. Here, they have considered the need of the pay persons and uh, the concept is the equity where everybody can see the match. 
So then there are different terms in the quality arena, the quality control. Since the time is limited, I'm not going to talk much on these uh, concepts, but basically the quality control is we, uh, we try to remove the bad products and try to uh, keep the good products. For example, if you have gone to a drink, drink like soft drink producing company or the factory, you would see that there is a screen where these, these people screen all the bottles coming. And if there is any uh, damaged product, they will remove it. So the quality control is something like that. But the quality assurance is you... Uh, like you, you attend to the total procedure, prevention of quality problems through planned and systematic activities, uh, including all the aspects of the process, which enable a product of a defined standards or quality. So it is going beyond the quality control, the quality assurance. Then we talked about CQI. These are some of the terms we use in the quality arena. Continuous quality improvement. That is, you have to improve your level of standards uh, little by little to a superior level. Then the TQM is the total quality management where uh, we pay attention to the total process and get the support of everybody in the department and keeping the cost to a minimum. So this is also one of the key important factor in a hospital or the institutional quality assurance programs because uh, the quality can fail due to a problem of one person, even though all others are good. Say, for example, in a hospital, if all the doctors, nurses talk very well to patients, but the security is shouting as the patient, the patients will not feel this as a quality service. Then there are this 5S concept that sees the basis of the quality programs. I'm not going to talk much about these things, but when you uh, pass out, uh, if you stay in the country, you can come. Some of you all may not be staying in the country, I know but still at least try to serve your people well during your internship because this may be your only chance of serving the people. I have now completed 24 years of service. I can look back and be satisfied with myself because I have served the country well. Uh, I, uh, so likewise, at the end, you should be satisfied with yourself, even according to your religion. So try to do your maximum service during your internship and during the career. So the 5S is one of the key basic components of uh, quality. Uh, there are our training programs conducted by the directorate. We are we are uh, discussing and uh, making people familiar with these concepts. So we can see the pictures before the implementation of 5S, the pharmacy after the implementation. So then again, we talk about the term Kaisens. Again, it is the continuous quality improvement. So this is important not only in our work life, but our day-to-day -day life also. Even though we do small, small improvement, at the end, the results will be dramatic. So we need you all to uh, utilize this concept to improve your career life as well as your personal life. So with that, I will come to the second part of my presentation. That is the National Quality Assurance Program. Uh, so the aim of the National Quality Assurance Program is establishing a continuous quality improvement process 
by setting up organizational structures and mechanisms at all the healthcare institutions. So there has been a circular in 2019 where this organization structure was developed. The APEX is the quality secretariat. Now we call the Directorate of Healthcare Quality and Safety. Then there should be quality management unit in the hospitals as well as in other campaigns and specialized units. Of course, in hospitals, above base hospitals, this quality management unit is functioning well, but even the DHS officers fairly well. But the campaigns and other smaller hospitals, we need to strengthen because our directorate is relatively new, which was established in 2012. So the functions expected from the directorate is to facilitate the implementation of policy and the strategic plans, then to prepare and disseminate standards, guidelines, and procedures, capacity building. Uh, monitoring and evaluation. So those are the some of the functions. Then when we consider the functions of institutional quality management unit, they are to establish work improvement teams. That is in different units, they get the support of some interested people to make these small, small improvement in the unit. Size and improvement. So when you go to your Awards, there may be some work improvement teams. Mostly the nurses are involved, but try to involve these activities. It will be a good experience for you all if there is no work improvement teams, because you all will be the, uh, the key medical staff dealing with the rest of the staff. So try to establish some work improvement teams with the support of the quality management unit in the hospitals. There is a medical officer assigned in most of these hospitals, or else there are nursing officers. So with the support of them, try to establish work improvement team or actively participate. Then they will be conducting some trainings and you have to establish a quality culture. Quality culture is one where we talk about no blame culture, of course, in the incident reporting, this will be discussed more. Uh, they have to develop a quality improvement plans, implementation of standards and guidelines. So no matter however we develop standards and guidelines, it's a matter of implementing. So you all will be the key people who will be implementing these guidelines. So try to find out the certain guidelines when you are managing a patient see whether there are particular guidelines for managing these patients. Study those and try to implement. As you may know, the malaria is uh, one of the diseases we have eliminated and we are ahead of the regional countries with regards to that. We achieved this success by implementing the guidelines. The campaigns uh, was very keen on uh, ensuring the implementation. We attend to the work of the hospitals, ensure that the doctors are following that. So with that, only we were able to eliminate malaria and uh, maintaining that. So then they will be conducting customer satisfaction and the employee satisfaction service, incident reports. So try to enroll in this work as well as support. So I think the time allocated to me is already over. So I will rush through this. There is a national policy, policy on healthcare quality and safety. Since 2015, there had been. We revised this in 2021. These are the mission and mission. And there are seven key results areas. First one is patient satisfaction. So they are, uh, we will uh, develop mechanisms to ensure timeliness of service delivery, establish facilities and standards, uh, surveillance system of customer satisfaction. Then the managerial process, 
improvement again the national standards benchmarking of good practices at the moment uh, we have our performance review meeting where we give chance for the hospitals to showcase their best practices to the others so they can learn from that as well as for the patient safety day we will be conducting we have conducted we have been conducting competitions among the hospitals to showcase their best practices so and we are in the process of establishing a accreditation system also to the country then the clinical effectiveness again uh, developing clinical protocols guideline promoting clinical audit so again this is one of the very important concepts for you all to practice we have a training on clinical audit you all can apply uh, then the uh, ensure ethical clinical practice then the fourth one is Fourth key result area is risk management and safety. So there are the incident reporting also comes as well as the medication safety, surgical safety, enabling cults where we talk about the work improvement team, the spiritual health of the staff, so some of those areas. Then the continuous professional in development and research. So these are some of the activities we do, training of master trainers in the directorate, this is our directorate. We are located in the car, within the castle hospital premises. So you all can contact us. You can refer our website if you need any support from us. We are happy to be of service. Training on clinical audit, others, training programs, then we conduct the performance reviews of hospitals above base hospital level. So they are, we have a performance review format where we captured many of the indicators. It's very good for you all to have some idea on the indicators we are monitoring because you also have to contribute with the data. Uh, some slides to see an idea about our performance review format. You can see VISS in the waiting time. Then the medicine related indicators, indicators related to all four specialties here about the blood sugar and the blood pressure and development of clinical guidelines. So some of the guidelines we develop with consultative meetings. Then the accreditation, we are working under a, a fund we obtain uh, with the support of the Global Fund for AIDS, TB and Malaria. So other in interventions we are doing include uh, supervision of primary uh, healthcare institutions, medication safety action plan, celebration of world patient safety, and the Surgical safety checklist, again, those, I think it would have been covered by Dr. Jayendra or will cover. So this is our consent, surgical consent form. So you all be uh, doing a part of your internship in a surgical unit. So please ensure that the consent form is practiced. Surgical safety checklist is completed because the compliance with these uh, things are not to the satisfactory level we need to improve. So medication safety action plan, celebration of World Patient Safety Day, which is falling on 17 September. We can, you can see how the healthcare institutions are recognized for their best practices. So you can, uh, get more details from our website, our circulars, guidelines, other details are available there. So those are the key things I wanted to discuss with you.
So your support is very important in this quality improvement process. So let's together improve the healthcare quality and safety in our country, which is a very timely need at the moment, even though we are facing certain restrictions, we have faced such things even in past. We have to uh, come out with this situation, especially with your dedication, we can do a lot. So thank you very much. If you have any comments or questions, please feel free to uh, express those now because I need to leave also. If you have any questions, please let me know. Okay, there seems to be no questions or comment. So I think I can stop there. Thank you very much for your keen interest. I really appreciate your participation with your comments and answers. That very good. Keep it up uh, and uh, serve our people well. Thank you and all the best for your future. Very much, Madam Dr. for our introduction on the quality dimensions and uh, on the healthcare quality assurance program. Uh, next, uh, for the next session, we have uh, here with us uh, Professor Priyadarshini Galapati, uh, Professor in Pharmacology at the Faculty of Colombo. Um, she will be talking about prescription writing and medication safety. Uh, over to you, Madam. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, let me. Okay, good morning to all of you. Can you uh, can you see the slides? Can you see the slides here? Yes, we can see the slides. Okay, and you can hear us well? Yes, Good. we can hear. Okay, uh, let me put it to the presentation mode. All right. Okay. Um, so good morning to all of you. Um, I'm, uh, I, I would like to thank uh, the Directorate of Healthcare Quality and Safety uh, for organizing this important um, uh, session, online training program for all the um, pre-intern uh, doctors who will be uh, serving our country uh, shortly. Um, and uh, so this uh, particular lecture is on safe use of medicines and prescription writing. I think one of the most important tasks that um, you are going to uh, uh, do when you start your internship uh, shortly. By the way, when are you starting internship? <laughs> Sorry? We haven't been given a date, Madam, yet. So most likely on the 31st of this month or the 1st of uh, November. Okay, right. Good, good. Right. So very shortly, you'll be starting your journey as a doctor. And I am sure you all are very um, excited about it and uh, waiting to, um, you know, uh, uh, start your work. Um, I know it's a very important milestone in your lives. Uh, but... Uh, uh, just as much as it's a very important uh, uh, milestone in your lives, it's a very responsible task that you are doing. And one of the most important responsible tasks is uh, prescribing. So this gives the outline of my presentation. Uh, uh, I will be first talking about the safe use of medicines, uh, particularly talking about the kind of medication errors uh, that happen. Uh, uh, how prevalent they are, and I will try to give some real-life examples of some errors that have happened, serious errors that have happened uh, in Sri Lanka. Uh, you may have heard of some of the serious errors that happened even in the recent past. Some of the contributing factors, so if you know the contributing factors, you will be able to um, prevent them before such errors happen subsequently. 
and then I will get on to prescription writing. Um, and uh, after, uh, you know, identifying about the uh, uh, medication errors, you will realize the important components of a prescription. And that will also um, uh, uh, touch upon rational prescribing as well, because that is also part of um, good prescription writing. Um, so I believe there will be many of my students from the Colombo Medical Faculty, uh, as well as there will be students uh, uh, from other faculties as well. Right, so what is the importance of this topic? Um, if you consider uh, a person coming into healthcare, the most common intervention that we give uh, to patients is giving medicines, right? Because you would realize that we will not be uh, we will not be subjecting many patients to surgery and uh, the kind of intervention that we uh, do, uh, other, uh, you know, maybe investigations, but the most common intervention that we do is giving medicines to patients. And in that process, when we are giving medicines, the most important task and the most important factor leading to errors you all are going to do, which is prescribing. And it's a leading cause of medication errors. And we have done a systematic review. I know you, are, you know what a systematic review is, collection of all studies looking at that particular uh, aspect. And uh, such systematic review that we have done on studies pertaining to uh, relevant to medication uh, errors, we have identified that, that there's a prevalence of 20 to 99% in Sri Lanka, I'm not talking about the countries in the world, in Sri Lanka, uh, where various types of medication errors occur. And uh, the Ragama faculty recently did a, has done a survey among 406 uh, pre-intern medical graduates um, in a training program. And in that one, they have shown that only one third had knowledge of essential components of a prescription. So I think therefore it is very relevant uh, that uh, uh, we tell you, uh, or, or rather we, I think all medical faculties would have told you what should be there in a prescription, but maybe uh, need to be again um, reinforced, uh, again, uh, 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 you know, informed uh, again and reminded you of all that, uh, you know, those important components. And um, this uh, uh, knowledge has imp uh, increased to one half after a training program they conducted, and particularly the knowledge on uh, management of anaphylaxis had been poor. That's what we, they have found. So therefore, I have just shown the relevance of this particular topic um, for a uh, for a um, new doctor who is going to start uh, uh, your work at the end of this month or early next month. Uh, this actually gives some uh, prevalence data on medication errors. So in Sri Lanka, I was telling you the overall is uh, some 20 to 99%. The prevalence of prescribing errors, which is relevant to you, uh, in nine studies, we found that it was 20 to 74%. So there were, uh, in, in one particular study, up to 74% various types of errors were found, uh, identified. And uh, prevalence of dispensing errors was 33 to 99%. And most, um, you know, 99% uh, uh, because, you know, in some instances, the, the, the uh, medicines are not labeled. So that is a very important um, uh, requirement when you are giving medicine. So uh, that's why uh, that particular study had, you know, only 1% of patients had uh, the labeling of medicines. Uh, there has been a systematic review conducted in low and middle income countries on uh, prevalence of uh, preventable uh, 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 medication errors. And that had shown that the prescribing um, error rate was 71, uh, 7 to 7% 7 to 90%. So in various countries, and you can see like transcribing up to 70%, uh, again, dispensing uh, 35% and administering also up to 80% uh, 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 errors. And there were no studies on monitoring errors. So um, 
this is not common uh, it is this is not a problem which is only found in uh, low and middle income countries in fact uh, from the data you would see that it might appear that it is more sometimes in high income countries but that is because we don't have much data coming from the low exact data coming from low and middle income countries so this particular publication in the british medical journal uh, you know one of the leading journals which all of us refer to to get information um, in 2016 highlighted that there are 180,000 iatrogenic deaths per year. Now, what I meant by iatrogenic deaths? Yeah. What I meant by iatrogenic deaths? Anyone? Yes. I'm sure you know what iatrogenic deaths are. Anyone? Hmm? What are you doing this? Okay, let's see. What do the people say? No reason found. That's due to, yeah. So that's due to errors by not only doctors. Somebody has said due to doctors. That due to healthcare, right? Anyone. It can be. It's not uh, really not no reason found. Iatrogenic means um, uh, that it is as a result of the healthcare. It may be by doctors, nurses, pharmacists, by anybody, right? And actually, some argue that there are over four hundred deaths per year. The actual figure is over four hundred, four hundred thousand. And the most important thing is these are most are preventable. Up to three fourths, seventy eight percent are preventable. And uh, so I think Devani also mentioned earlier, in developed countries, one in 10 patients are harmed due to medical errors during hospital care. And in, uh, uh, in developed countries, in developing countries, the prevalence is considered to be, I will switch off my video so it will be easy, I think, for you all. Um, and in uh, developed countries, in developing countries, the prevalence uh, is, is much more. And uh, if you consider aviation and nuclear power plants, they have found that actually uh, the um, error uh, rates are uh, much better uh, in aviation and nuclear power plants. So if I may ask you, uh, you know, because rather than me talking all the time, <laughs> if I may ask you, if you take a flight to go somewhere, what is your risk of death? Is it one in... 100,000, one in uh, uh, 500,000, one in a million, one in a 10 million, one in 20 million. What, do, what, what is your guess? Any guesses? One in a million, yes. Okay, good. And what do you think is, uh, uh, is the death rate if somebody comes uh, uh, for uh, health care? What is the rate of death in a hospital? Again, uh, what is the rate? One in uh, uh, 10,000, 10, 100,000, one in a million, one in two million, what? In healthcare. Yeah. Let's see whether, um, you know, some of my students can remember. I would have given this figure, maybe, I am, I'm not sure, when I did uh, some of my lectures in the, in the Colombo faculty. Yeah, anyone? Healthcare, what is the rate? Any guesses? Is it higher or lower? Flight? One in 11 million, healthcare one in 10. I think you are having a very poor, <laughs> this is death rate. You are uh, probably having a very poor opinion of uh, healthcare. Well, anyway, I, I won't, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, I won't uh, sort of argue on that. But um, if you uh, uh, consider the uh, death rates, right, it is, uh, yeah. So these are the real figures. Um, so 
risk of death, uh, death while air travel is one in a million, but see the risk of death due to medical errors in hospitals is about one in 300, right? So that high, if one patient of every 300 who get admitted to hospital will die due to a medical error, right? So this is uh, uh, not only uh, medication errors, but all types of errors, right? So, uh, uh, so uh, uh, this is during healthcare, maybe surgical error or diagnostic error, whatever, right? So therefore, you know, I often say that now when somebody goes, uh, uh, you know, overseas, we say, okay, have a safe journey, have a safe uh, uh, travel, safe travels. But I think what we should be telling actually when somebody is getting admitted to a hospital is that have a safe stay in hospital. Right, because they are more likely to die, uh, not due to the illness that they are having, but due to the uh, health care that is offered to them. So I think as the new generation who is going to offer health care to other patients in this country and then globally as well. So this is a very important factor that you must keep in your mind and make everything possible that you can do to prevent any such deaths occurring um, uh, at uh, you know your hands and at least or uh, not contribute to such errors uh, where a patient might die uh, as a result of healthcare. So again, to give some more uh, data, this particular publication, most recent publication on preventable patient harm in healthcare showed that at least one in 20 patients are affected by preventable all types of patient harm. And the important finding that this study uh, found from Manchester University is that at least almost 50% of preventable patient harm occurs due to medication errors. Right, due to treatments and the medicines that are uh, given to patients. So therefore, it's uh, all other errors like surgical errors, diagnostic errors, um, you know, healthcare associated infections, all constitute the other 50%. Almost 50% are due to medicines and the treatments that they receive. And um, so, uh, but our topic for today is medication errors. So a medication error is defined as any preventable event that may cause or lead to inappropriate medication use or patient harm. Remember, while the medication is in the control of the healthcare professional or even the patient or the consumer, that is the person who is, uh, you know, it may not be a patient, but a healthy person who is consuming, like, you know, who is taking a vaccine or a oral contraceptive pill or whatever. So, so therefore, uh, uh, the uh, even when the uh, medicine is with the patient, we have a responsibility because we may not have given the correct advice to the patient or um, or the uh, you know uh, instituted proper procedures when when uh, giving that particular uh, medical intervention. And on preventable medication harm, again, there was a systematic review. And in that one, uh, they have identified that one in 30 patients are harmed due to preventable medication errors. This is global figures. And then actually, there is a recent WHO publication, which is coming out shortly, which has shown actually it is one in 20 patients. So 5% are harmed due to preventable uh, medication errors. And highest rates are seen in elderly care patient settings. Now, as of now, still our uh, country, we do not have um, kind of elderly care facilities, but in other countries, they do have uh, geriatric care and also highly specialized care, like, uh, for example, uh, uh, ICUs, um, emergency medicine uh, treatment units and so on. And of all these errors, 26%, up to one fourth are uh, life threatening. And, and look at this, the source of highest preventable rates occurred at prescribing stage, 58%, right? And then monitoring stage. Monitoring means when you are after giving the medicine, you know, monitoring of that therapy. We have to, even, even a medicine like anti-diabetics, anti-hypertensives, you have to monitor whether the patient's blood sugar is controlled, blood pressure is controlled. So if that monitoring has not happened properly, then also patient can be harmed. And the categories of medicines that have caused most harm was the central nervous system and cardiovascular system medicines. So these are the stages of medication where all these errors can occur. 
um, you know, all these, uh, you know, stages, I don't need to, uh, uh, you know, describe. But what is transcribing? Uh, if I may ask, I'm sure the others are self-explanatory. What, what, what do you mean by transcribing? Anyone? What is meant by transcribing? Hmm? Any guesses? Yeah. Yes. Can you give an example of a, a transcribing? What what do the nurses do when you now when you go start working as a house officer? You will be writing medicines on the um, BHD, isn't it? Bed head ticket. And when you write the uh, bed, uh, medicines on the BHD, uh, then the medicines that are given to the patients are in a drug chart. So who writes those onto the drug chart? Yeah, copying the uh, to the drug chart by the nurses. Good, yes. Yeah. So either copying the drugs to the drug chart by the nurses or when you uh, write a prescription in the clinic, writing the those drugs, the uh, what the patient has to take onto the patient's dispensing labels. That is also transcribing, which is done by the pharmacist, right? So therefore, the initiator of all these, initiator uh, is the prescriber. And then um, uh, transcribing happens by other people down the, uh, uh, the, the medication use process. So let me now tell you some, uh, you know, real life examples of medication errors that have taken place, mostly uh, from here. So there was a six-year-old child weighing 20 kilograms prescribed one tab paracetamol, one tablet, three times a day, right? So uh, I will not ask actually what is the correct dose of uh, paracetamol for a child, which all of you should know, right? All of you should know, uh, which is the maximum dose is up to 15 milligrams per kg per dose. So therefore, for a child weighing 20 kilogram, the maximum uh, is a dose that can be given is 300 milligrams. Okay. So when one tablet is 500 milligrams, uh, this child uh, received up to uh, nearly double the dose of paracetamol. And after three or four days of taking paracetamol like that, the child was admitted to LRH and the ASTs and ALTs were over 1,000. So this was due to incorrect calculation of the dose, right? So every child who is receiving paracetamol um, should um, uh, have the dose calculated according to the body weight of the child. Probably the doctor thought that, you know, our adult dose is two tablets um, uh, uh, three to four times a day. So a six-year-old child was probably considered as half an adult or, or no dose calculation was never done. And that's why, you know, one tablet uh, was written. So it's a serious mistake, right? And uh, I wonder whether you are aware that recently, uh, uh, unfortunately, a seven-year-old child died of paracetamol uh, overdose. Do you know why that happened? about two months ago, two or three months ago. What was the reason there? Hmm? Anyone who has heard of that story? Hmm? There, it was not a prescribing error. It was actually a dispensing error, right? Uh, so the there, this has happened in an um, outstation hospital. Uh, and the uh, medicines have been uh, dispensed, wrapped up in a piece of paper, which happens sometimes in some of the, uh, not now in major hospitals like the NHSL, but in uh, some peripheral hospitals, wrapped up in a piece of paper. And they have, uh, what is written is no name is given, right? Uh, one is to three or two is to three or like that. So in the wrapped up paper, uh, they normally put the adult dose. So outside it has been written as outside or inside they have written as two is to three. And then they have uh, written the correct uh, in instructions. So they have actually inside it has been two is to uh, three, but outside, uh, because when they are wrapping up, they have always written two is to three, but outside when they are dispensing, they have written it as one is to three, the, uh, the do dose for a uh, smaller child. But the 
parents not knowing this is paracetamol or they don't know the dose also probably. So what is written inside as two is into three and they have given the child two tablets three times a day. And unfortunately, this, um, this uh, child died uh, after a few days um, after getting admitted to hospital uh, of liver failure. So it's a very, very unfortunate situation of a paracetamol uh, causing death of a uh, uh, child. So therefore, remember, uh, some of you would be working in pediatric units. So always remember to write uh, prescriptions for children, um, uh, calculated, dose calculated according to the weight of the child, and particularly when you are using paracetamol. With paracetamol, there's another um, uh, error that may occur because paracetamol syrup contains, uh, you know, 5 milligrams in 125 ml, whereas there's a dropper which has uh, 80 milligrams in 1 ml. So, uh, and it is about uh, four times the dose um, uh, in, in, in 5 ml. So, um, we have recently stopped this um, dropper because of the errors uh, that have been reported. But now with the drug shortages, sometimes these are coming as donations and therefore there may be uh, this type of various preparations coming into the uh, country and available through hospital. So be mindful of that. In another situation, a patient who was prescribed calcium tablets was written as CaCO3. I, uh, you know, I'm not surprised. You all write so many. I won't say you all. Our doctors write so many uh, abbreviations, and uh, you are probably you know, going to join that bandwagon. But please don't write these abbreviations because they cause so many, they uh, uh, promote so many errors. Now, the pharmacist thought it was lithium carbonate written as LiCO3 because CA, the, the handwriting was such that they uh, he thought it was LiCO3 and lithium was dispensed leading to lithium toxicity, renal failure and the patient requiring dialysis. So, so therefore, um, uh, uh, therefore, that's uh, the, avoid this type of uh, uh, you know um, uh, using abbreviations. There's a question here. I'm happy that well, you all are putting questions. I will try to answer as we go through. What is paracetamol dose for an adult weighing about 40 kg? Is it safe to give normal adult uh, dose to tablet dose? Very good question. I think um, this is uh, again uh, uh, something that we have to be careful about. We have some particularly females, uh, you know, who are 40 kg. So don't give the two tablet dose to such, um, uh, uh, you know, adults repeatedly. So again, calculate according to the body weight because um, these doses of the standard doses are for standard adults in developed countries where the average weight is about 60 to 70 kg, whereas our people are uh, much, uh, you know, their weight is smaller. So that is why we see that most of the doses that even sometimes the other countries uh, uh, are recommending in other country guidelines, we, we find that most uh, often our people require much smaller doses. So, so therefore, good question. So even if, uh, for a, a small built adult, again, better to calculate according to the body weight and then give if you are giving repeatedly. One dose, of course, would not be a problem if you give a slightly higher dose. But if you are giving repeatedly, yes, uh, calculate according to the body weight and give, which is much more safer. Right. So... Uh, like that, if you have any questions, uh, please uh, put into the chat box. I will uh, answer as I go through, right? Another prescribing error, a 45-year-old patient uh, who was admitted with cellulitis of the leg was prescribed IV cloxacillin. And uh, the patient developed difficulty in breathing and became hypotensive and re developed anaphylactic reaction. On subsequent, uh, you know, going back, the patient had a history of rash to amoxicillin, which had not been elicited by the doctor nor the nurse who administered it. Right? So remember, penicillins, cephalosporins are all in the beta-lactam group. You know that. And therefore, if there is a uh, you know definite uh, history of um, a reaction to any uh, 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 penicillin group uh, antibody given previously, then they are likely to have a severe reaction, particularly if an intravenous um, 
the beta lactam is administered. And you know that recently there were many deaths due to um, some cephalosporins as well as coamoxiclav administered uh, to patients. So, so few, so few patients died. Uh, so always when you are giving um, uh, uh, penicillins and cephalosporins, be mindful of the risk of anaphylactic reactions and uh, check on the um, uh, history of allergy. Uh, in another situation, again, this is an unfortunate situation where a patient who was prescribed, a, a doctor prescribed azathioprine 250 BD instead of 25 milligram BD. Now, as you start your internship, you will not be aware of uh, the uh, correct dose of a drug like perhaps azathioprine, which is not a very commonly prescribed drug, unlike a drug like inalapril or uh, um, uh, propranolol or something like atanolol or something like that. So always you must check. Now here, um, you know, instead of 25 BD, it was 10 times the dose. And unfortunately, the, the pharmacist also dispensed the same uh, dose. So which is five tablets to be taken twice day, twice twice a day, because the patient was also for an autoimmune condition, was on um, 30 uh, tablets of uh, 30 milligrams of prednisolone. So the pharmacist thought, oh, okay, this is also similar high dose. Again, uh, uh, a pharmacist who is not really aware. And one week later, the patient was admitted with fever, gum bleeding. And the, the irony uh, uh, of the situation was that the same treatment was continued in the ward for another two days also without realizing that they were giving a um, toxic dose of uh, uh, azathioprine and the patient uh, uh, died subsequently of sepsis and thrombocytopenia and bleeding and this was uh, went into an inquiry and uh, you know complained to the president as well this happened about uh, i think one or two years ago so therefore the the um, uh, lesson is that if you are not sure of the dose, please, please double check, particularly these high-risk medicines. I will tell you about the high-risk medicines shortly. Then some dispensing errors. A patient with asthma who was prescribed prednisolone 30 milligrams was dispensed glibenclamide 6 tablets and patient became unconscious and survived with brain damage. Now, why do you think this patient uh, uh, who was prescribed prednisolone was dispensed glibenclamide? Yeah. Why do you think that error happened? Anyone? Yeah. Yes. What is the reason? Yeah. What is the appearance of uh, prednisolone tablet? Yeah. Somebody. It's a very small white tablet, madam. Yes, very good. So it's both tablets. Prednisolone is also a white colored small tablet. Glibenclamide is also a white colored small tablet. And uh, both bottles were open and the pharmacist, uh, you know, has taken um, the, uh, the uh, tablets from the glibenclamide bottle instead of the prednisolone bottle. And again, this was uh, this went into an inquiry uh, by the SLMC as well, um, because the patients uh, complain and patient has permanent brain in, uh, damage. In a similar situation in the UK, uh, a patient uh, has received propranolol 40 instead of prednisolone 40. And they are, they are, the packaging was similar because propranolol 40, the, the outer carton was similar. Again, the patient has become hypotensive as, and his, uh, the asthma has aggravated and died. So these are all uh, due to, uh, you know, again, similar looking uh, or similar sounding medicines. In Sri Lanka, uh, we had a situation where metformin 500 BD was dispensed instead of uh, uh, the, the uh, patient prescribed uh, metformin 500 BD was dispensed methotrexate 5 milligram BD and uh, a patient developed agranulocytosis, sepsis and died, right? So again, uh, and then this happened about two or three years ago. I, uh, if if uh, some people, uh, you know, watch uh, news about two months ago, again, a similar instance occurred where when a patient was prescribed something like, uh, uh, again, it was not clear what the, uh, it was shown on the national TV. It was, I will, I think I have a slide on that later. Um, and uh, again, I think it was like mesalazine, which was prescribed and, but what was dispensed was methotrexate. 
So these are all due to what are called um, look-alike, sound-alike medicines. I will be explaining um, on that a bit more detail uh, in my subsequent slides. Yeah, so this is, uh, yeah, so this is death uh, due to wrong medicine. Uh, <clears throat> this is what, uh, you know, the, the uh, report uh, uh, that was there on national TV. So here, this is, uh, if you can see uh, what is given here, it looks like it is mesalazine. This is a, they say Niyamakal Aushade and Ususalin Nikutkal Aushade was methotrexate. So you know that methotrexate is given once a week for a condition like rheumatoid arthritis. <clears throat> and um, so when it is given daily, that's, uh, you know, again, a sure situation where the patient will come to serious harm and often death. So many instances where methotrexate has been dispensed daily to patients erroneously. Uh, the uh, patient uh, uh, deaths have occurred. So remember that and always therefore um, uh, when you are writing also sometimes this type of errors can occur uh, because we are writing everything daily so it's a, a mistake that might happen you might write as you know methotrexate uh, 5 milligrams or 10 milligrams daily and the, if it is a pharmacist uh, who is not knowledgeable pharmacist will dispense that and this type of errors can occur. Some administration errors, I'm giving you various these uh, examples because you will then only realize the gravity of the problem and, uh, and then, uh, you know, be mindful when you're starting work. I, I believe that, you know, you are now, you know, taking your uh, job seriously, what you're planning, uh, you know, embarking on in a week or two so that uh, you will be mindful when you are prescribing these medicines. A doctor gave chloral hydrate drawn into a syringe by a nurse for oral. Now, in, in generally in wards, the doctors are expected to give chloral hydrate. The nurses don't give. And because it is for a small child, the nurse has drawn it into a syringe and kept it for the doctor to give it orally. Uh, for IV sedation for a procedure in a child. But the doctor, he put the cannula uh, and then thought what was there in the uh, syringe was IV flush solution and in injected chloral hydrate. Child became unconscious, uh, I needed ICU care and ventilation. So always, even if somebody hands you over the medicine, just double check what this is. Never give anything which is lying on a trolley or on a uh, you know bedside, uh, which is unlabeled because many errors have occurred as a result. In another instance, a patient prescribed six units of insulin was administered 60 units because six U, it was written as six U and the U is uh, you know interpreted as uh, zero. Uh, and... Uh, so fortunately, in this situation, the patient was aware that she is taking uh, six units and she saw there was a larger volume and asked how much was given. And when the, uh, the patient when the um, patient said uh, that she is taking only six units, the error was identified immediately and uh, they were able to give uh, dextrose and prevented hypoglycemia. And this happened in a night. So fortunately, this was realized because of uh, the patient was vigilant and patient was knowledgeable, otherwise patient would have, you know, drifted into hypoglycemia in the night and may have even died. Um, in another situation, very unfortunate situation, a baby was administered intramuscular ergometrine, which was meant for the mother. The mother was having some postpartum bleeding and they were going to give uh, ergometrine to the mother. And, and uh, IEM vitamin K was to be given to the baby and both syringes were, uh, you know, drawn and kept. And what was, but unfortunately, it was the ergometrine uh, uh, syringe, uh, which was given to the uh, baby intramuscularly, and the baby died after about two days. So, it's a very, very unfortunate situation. Imagine this type of a thing happening to, you know, one of uh, your kid and kin, and we will be so, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, I don't know what to call that. Uh, it's unbelievable. So therefore, please be mindful of all these errors. These are not common. If they are rare, but, you know, can result in uh, patient death and harm. And you will carry that burden for the rest of your life if something like that happened at the hands of, uh, at your hands. So therefore, uh, please be aware of these errors and try to, um, you know, prevent these. So um, 
this is uh, again a, a study which is showing that legibility of prescription is about only 50% and so many non-standard abbreviations. So these uh, predispose to uh, many errors. Uh, this particular study from Rajarata University showed that most 65% of the prescriptions were legible only with effort and about 53% had potential drug interactions. Now you can see this prescription. I don't know whether any one of you can decipher what is written here. I can't, right? So therefore, uh, and you can see here now, uh, the pharmacist has um, uh, written, please check the dosage form. Maybe the, the pharmacist has written, uh, deciphered what the drug is, but asking the dosage form. So uh, uh, I can't read what this is, right? So when this type of things happen, pharmacists interpret what this is likely to be. And then uh, this, uh, you know, very serious errors can occur. So here again, uh, uh, another illegible prescription. Here again, the pharmacist has written, um, doctor, clarify the drugs, please, right? So now sometimes doctors get offended when pharmacists uh, write like this. And, you know, there have been situations where they have been scolded. Uh, these are things that, uh, you know, some of our doctors have uh, uh, said. So please don't do that because they are also asking it in the interest of the patient, right? Not, not to, you know, antagonize the doctor or anything. So it is also in your interest as well. Please thank them if they do that, right? Because uh, it is much better to correct it at that point rather than give a wrong drug, wrong dose to a patient and a patient coming to a harm and an inquiry, uh, you know, initiated against you as well. So, so therefore, uh, 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 please write prescriptions clearly. When you are writing a prescription, always, uh, you know, ask uh, the question, can somebody read this uh, 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 prescription and would they get this wrong? So then you will be writing clearly. Again, you know, similar uh, prescriptions. I'm just giving some few examples. Right. So what are the contributory factors uh, uh, for errors? Uh, the contributory factors for errors uh, include, sorry, the first uh, and foremost patient factors. There are some patients who are more vulnerable to errors, like who are elderly, having renal dysfunction, and then uh, patients who are not knowledgeable on the medicines uh, who take is a big problem. Uh, most of our patients, uh, when we did a study, only 42% knew the uh, name of the drug. Only 41% knew the indication. Uh, dose, only 22% knew. They knew the dose by you know, one tablet or two tablets, but not that they are taking inalapril 2.5 milligram or 5 milligram. So if the uh, you know strength varies, then they will not know whether it is the correct dose or not. Uh, then... Um, Frequency, they knew because they know you have to take it uh, one or two times a day. But uh, then other additional information, very few knew. So therefore, this is uh, another contributory factor uh, for errors. Many staff factors that are lead, uh, uh, contributing to errors. Inexperienced personnel. Now, you intern house officers, as you start, we all know that you are you know, not experienced in this game. And uh, that is why we are having this type of training program. Similarly, that uh, student nurses as they start, uh, internal pharmacists, uh, intern pharmacists as they start, are more likely to make errors. Then anybody in rushing and emergency situations, you are likely to make errors. Multitasking, you are going to do one thing, a call comes and uh, you know, then uh, you might do something wrong. Uh, which is again interrupted mid-task, um, uh, 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 which can lead to errors. Fatigue, lack of vigilance. I mean, if you you will be working long hours, you know, when you are doing internship, you know, sometimes the whole night, I can remember sometimes the whole night you are up and then the next day morning again, you have to go for work. You are, you know, sleepy, tired. And in such situations, you're more likely to uh, uh, do an error. So in that type of situation, again, be more vigilant. Lack of checking and double checking. We don't have that, uh, you know, culture of double checking. And uh, unfortunately, in our country, we do not have clinical pharmacists in the wards to check. Whereas you will note that when you work in a, a, a developed country, you know, like UK, Australia and so on, there are 
clinical pharmacies in the ward. So all the prescriptions that are written by the doctors and the, what is given to the patient, they review it. And if they note that anything, uh, you know, any dose error, uh, drug error, they will bring it to your notice. Unfortunately, we don't have that. Um, and therefore, uh, it is the responsibility of the uh, uh, doctors to do the double checking also. Now, this is a very interesting study, uh, you know, um, done uh, in UK, right? Very relevant to you now. So they found that there is early in-hospital mortality following trainee do doctors first day at work, right? So they found that the odds of death of patients admitted on the first Wednesday in uh, August was 6% higher and they attributed to new foundation um, year doctor starting work. Now, I think it's a very important uh, question which I asked. Uh, when are you going to start your internship? <laughs> so better not get admitted to hospital in that week because, uh, you know, if this is happening in the UK, it is more likely to happen, you know, uh, uh, in, in a country like ours. So in fact, it was, uh, but it's, it's not a laughing matter actually. So um, uh, after this particular uh, study, the General Medical Council uh, in the UK recommended uh, in his initiating a prescribing safety assessment prior to all prior to graduates taking up the foundation year. So now it has been implemented now, I think from about 2012. So they are having a um, prescribing safety assessment, which they take uh, sometimes as part of the uh, uh, part of their final year exam or, or they have to take it uh, be at least, uh, before they um, start their medical um, internship, which is called the foundation year. There are some workplace factors. I'm talking about the uh, you know factors responsible. Absence of a safety culture in the workplace, uh, which is, um, uh, again, as I mentioned, we are not uh, very strong on uh, safety culture. And then lack of reporting systems. We don't have reporting systems. We don't, because of that, we don't learn from our uh, past uh, misses and adverse events. And we have inadequate or untrained staffing. I mentioned about lack of ph clinical pharmacists. And we do not take uh, steps to uh, avoid errors from lookalike, sound like medicines, like uh, you know, storing them separately. So these uh, factors lead to uh, errors. And there are certain medication factors. I mentioned about similar looking, similar sounding, which are called look-alike, sound-alike medicines, LASA medicines. There are some what are called high-risk medicines. And then there are deficiencies in packaging and labeling. I gave some examples also. Very small print, also uh, difficult to read or no labeling at all. So these are some of the medication factors. So these are some of the sound-alike drugs that in prescriptions that we identified in a uh, uh, you know, um, uh, survey. And so you can imagine what would happen if uh, carbimazole is dispensed to a patient who should be on carbamazepine for epilepsy. Patient will go into hypothyroidism, um, may even get agranulocytosis due to carbamazepine and uh, sorry, carbimazole and the uh, fits will go out of hand and might go, uh, get an epileptic fit also. So these are things which were detected by the pharmacist and the error was corrected. If you, uh, you know, dispense uh, uh, theophylline instead of thyroxine, if you uh, give dipyridamole instead of diltiazem, and if you give amiodarone and antiarrhythmic uh, instead of amlodipine, you can see what type of errors could occur. So, so many uh, possibilities uh, for harm. These are some of these look-alike, sound-alike pairs, right? So, this is ketamine and midazolam. So, uh, again, um, you know, very serious error can occur if uh, one is used for the other. Here, bupivacaine and sodium chloride. So, imagine what would happen if you inject bupivacaine thinking it is flush solution of sodium chloride, right? So, serious uh, and these type of things have happened. And here, uh, uh, these are again, uh, you know, from our hospitals. Um, now, this is like the labeling that is happening in uh, Sakalamu South Teaching Hospital. They label these medicines. Now, if you label, uh, you know, if this labeling is not done properly, 
you can mistake diclofenac for bisoprolol. Uh, this is actually glycoside mistaking for enalapril. Many situations have occurred where patients have been getting admitted with recurrent hypoglycemia and to see they have been dispensed actually enalapril, not uh, they have been dispensed glycoside instead of enalapril. So uh, uh, a vigilant house officer actually identified one such situation where a patient was getting admitted for the third time with a hypoglycemic episode. Uh, and not a known diabetic patient, and then to see that instead of enalapril, what the patient has been dispensed was glycoside. Uh, some again similar, um, uh, you know, seri where serious errors can occur potassium chloride and sodium chloride. You can imagine, you know, what would happen if these are mistaken. Again, KCl and calcium chloride, right? So, when you're taking a uh, in an emergency situation, you would be taking a bottle and, uh, and injecting. So, be very mindful, right? Here again, uh, succinyl uh, 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 choline and sodium chloride. So patient will go into respiratory arrest if uh, you know succinyl choline is given instead of sodium chloride. Uh, the this type of look-alike sound-alike errors can occur even with the uh, different strengths of the same tablet. Now, warfarin, we have only one, three, and five milligrams, and they uh, uh, were uh, to be made available in three different colors. But, you know, um, at one point, we had, uh, you know, where all three tablets were coming in the uh, same white colored small tablet. And then there were patients who were getting with bleeding, and to see, you know, there has been errors made. Uh, uh, where uh, like five milligram tablet was given instead of three or one milligram. So there was a situation where a patient was admitted with bleeding and INR was 14. So now this has been prevented. Uh, now um, uh, the, uh, the registration point, uh, these type of things are not allowed into the country, but I do not know our registration process is having a lot of issues now. So these things might be coming in um, uh, without uh, stringent uh, uh, oversight. And so we have to be vigilant on, uh, uh, on these aspects. And if you note any of these problems, please notify so that before a patient harm occurs, these things can be uh, identified and corrected. There are some high risk situations for errors, uh, polypharmacy uh, and um, uh, high risk medicines and transitions of care, uh, like when a uh, uh, patient is uh, admitted to hospital or transferred, I will just touch upon a few things uh, uh, again on, on these as contributory factors. So polypharmacy, generally, there is no exact number as such, but generally considered when more than four drugs, that is five or more drugs prescribed. Sometimes you may need five drugs for the patient, you know, those are because uh, let's say if you are getting discharged after a acute coronary syndrome, you need five medicines, the uh, two antiplatelets, aspirin, clopidogrel, statin, beta blocker, and uh, ACE inhibitor. So five drugs are needed. Um, but the, what we are saying is if more than five drugs are prescribed, the chances of errors are more. So um, therefore, uh, you have to be mindful of the errors. So in a Sri Lankan study, 84% of elderly patients were on more than four drugs and therefore more prone to um, errors. Then there are certain high risk or high alert medicines. So these are the medicines. There are they the errors are not more common, but they are associated with a high risk of serious harm if they are used in error, right? Uh, so the consequences of an error are clearly more devastating to the patient. You saw, um, you know, like if you give methotrexate or insulin, uh, uh, you know, higher doses in error, clearly there will be serious patient harm. So. These are what are called the high risk or high alert medicines. Uh, there is a, a acronym called a pinch O, right? A pinch O. So uh, this is the Australian, you know, categorization uh, of of this, uh, you know, into these um, um, uh, into the uh, this acronym. So uh, A is for anti-infectives. Now earlier people were asking why 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 are uh, um, sorry there is a small mistake in penicillin. Um, uh, so why why are um, uh, antibiotics called high risk? Because you see they can cause severe anaphylactic reactions, and then aminoglycosides uh, you know can cause se severe um, uh, 
uh, you know, renal problems and uh, hearing loss and so on. Amphotericin B again, renal uh, problems. So I won't go into all details. You can see uh, potassium and other electrolyte solutions causing you know arrhythmias, even death, insulins and all hypoglycemics, um, all uh, like sulfonylureas. Again, sorry, there's a mistake. Narcotics like opioid and sedatives. Again, they can go into respiratory arrest. I mentioned about chemotherapeutic agents with methotrexate, azathioprine. Uh, and heparins and oral anticoagulants um, giving rise to bleeding. Others like lithium, adrenaline, vasopressors, antiarrhythmics, all these are um, high-risk medicines which can cause severe harm if the patient uh, if used in error. Another reason for um, a predisposing factor for error is using uh, error-prone abbreviations. They have about 70% of the our prescriptions. This is a local study had um, from the Javadanapur University. You might identify some of these, uh, you know, uh, teachers, Professor uh, Vanigatunga and so on. So up to 69% uh, abbreviations. And um, in, in a study that we did, these are some of the abbreviations that were used in the prescriptions. I mean, AZT has been used for both azathioprine as well as azithromycin, right? And uh, so this time, I, I think everybody uses as PCM, right? I think this is because of the, uh, you know, uh, limited time, but these can predispose to error. So therefore, we don't recommend using any other abbreviations um, because it can, now, HCQ uh, is hydrox hydroxychloroquine, but it can be mistaken for um, hydrocortisone, which are people have used HCS and also hydrochlorothiazide, HCT, right? So therefore, prednisolone uh, has been used PF. So, so many, you know, nobody can decipher what these are if these abbreviations are used. So please don't use abbreviations. And we found many errors in dose also. The commonest was in paracetamol actually. So, Please remember, and that was when it was given for children. And these are the other instances where, you know, we have found uh, these errors in uh, dose. Uh, yeah, somebody is asking, Madam, is using capitals when prescribing drugs is recommended? Uh, it is better, particularly if, you, if there is no, uh, you know, definite recommendation as such, but it is better, particularly if you want to highlight a high risk medicine or, or a medicine which can lead to uh, errors. Uh, but there is no real uh, recommendation uh, indicating to use capitals. Making it clear is what is uh, needed. I will come to uh, what is recommended in writing prescriptions. So reasons for do errors in dose is additional zero um, or less zero. Now, if you write it as, you know, uh, if you want to write five milligram, if you write it as 5.0, somebody can mistake it for 50 milligrams, right? Similarly, if you want to write 0.5 milligrams, if you just write dot and a five, then somebody can mistake it for um, uh, that dot can be not seen and can be mistaken for 5 milligrams. So 10 times the dose uh, mistakes can occur. And again, mix up of adult and pediatric doses, as I mentioned, with, you know, paracetamol, again, leads to uh, errors in dose. So these are all predisposing factors. So now how do we prevent the errors after learning about these, these factors? So this model called Swiss cheese model is used. Swiss cheese has holes in it, right? Uh, and then, so if you, you can uh, consider one slice of Swiss cheese as a, um, uh, one slice of Swiss cheese as one uh, step in the medication use process. So you start the process with prescription and then um, there can be, if there is an error, right, that can be detected at transcribing stage. The nurse might detect, ah, okay, doctor, this doc uh, dose is not correct and that can be prevented. But if the nurse doesn't see it, uh, uh, detect it, that is like uh, a hole there, right? So then it might go to the next stage, which is dispensing or administering. Uh, and if that is not detected there also, it is again like a hole being there. So generally, you can detect it at the next stage, but sometimes all these holes can be aligned with each other and they are the, the error can reach the patient causing a, either a you know severe patient or, or harm or a fatal medication error. 
So normally they have found that only 25% of the errors were detected before advancing to the next subsequent stage. And what is important to note here is that the, if an error reaches the patient, it is not due to the inappropriate action of just one person, but due to a combination of factors which result in a system failure. Right. So this is one important concept that we use in requesting people to um, report errors. So you are reporting an error not to find fault with the person uh, or the persons who were involved in the error, but you are trying to identify the reasons behind it and prevent such errors happening subsequently. So therefore, it's not just one person who is responsible, but many people as well as the sales care system in which we work. So you don't have to feel guilty about it. Uh, as long as you have done your part and, and try to, uh, if it is a mistake or a lapse uh, uh, and, uh, you know, which is contributed by other factors, like you have to write to so many uh, 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 prescriptions to so many patients, you know, you have had a long um, day, uh, you know, uh, 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 after a long night or something, these are not excuses, but if we know that these are the factors, then uh, some things can be done to uh, prevent or avoid this type of thing. It may be a lookalike sound like medicine. You can put labeling and so on to prevent those errors. So always check on five rights at all stages of medication that it is the right drug. What are the five rights? Right drug, it's the right drug that you are giving, prescribing, right route of administration, right, uh, right time of administration, right dose, and it is the right patient, okay? So it's very important to make sure that it is the, and then you can have other rights also, right documentation, right staff, and so on. So whether it's the right patient, I think, you know, this is again another uh, story. Uh, remember, there may be many Pereira, Silva, Sarats, uh, uh, you know, like that. The common names are common in Sri Lanka. So there was a situation where a patient who was admitted with chest pain was ordered an ECG. First ECG was normal. Then he was uh, uh, requested a second ECG. The ECG technician came and asked for Mr. Pereira. And, um, uh, you know, so one attendant called uh, Pereira Kauda, Pereira Kauda, and then Mr. Pereira raised his hand. The ECG technician took the ECG and he saw hyperacute changes. He immediately went and gave it to the uh, house officer. And then the patient's BHD was on the uh, nurse's, uh, you know, uh, doctor's desk. And he wrote the thrombolytics to be given, but to see, and then a nurse went to give the uh, uh, medicine to the patient. And while putting in the cannula, she was saying, oh, yeah, devani ECG ka hai, ka den and then the patient said, nah, devani ECG ka gatte nah. So, and then it was realized it had been another Mr. Pereira who had his uh, 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 thrombolytic the previous day. And then, uh, so um, he his uh, uh, ECG has been taken and they interpreted it as this patient's uh, uh, ECG. So remember, always double check the name of the patient when you are writing things on the BHC. BHCs might be lying on the table and then you might think that it is, uh, you know, uh, one patient's BHT, um, you know, which is... Uh, um, uh, uh, not belonging to that particular patient. Always double check with two things, like you have to check the name and the age, right? If you, uh, uh, the recommendation is to use two-factor authentication uh, for medicines. And for lookalike sound alike medicines, we recommend using what is called tall man lettering. Some letters of the uh, medicine are written in capital uh, so that they, the patient, uh, they will um, uh, be clearly visible to, to the person and they will make sure that it is the correct medicine that is dispensed um, or administered. Um, so to uh, countries use uh, uh, learning systems, uh, right? Reporting and learning systems to learn, to identify the kind of errors that of all these errors, which I told you are things which we have heard from here and there, not from a reporting system. 
we only have adverse drug reaction reporting, but countries uh, need to have um, uh, medication incident reporting. So we have drafted this. Uh, now this is uh, um, available. Uh, the DGHS has issued a circular, um, and using this medication incident reporting form, the you can use this form uh, to report to the uh, directorate uh, to the healthcare quality and safety unit of the hospital, and uh, you can fill everything or you can fill part of it and send it to the uh, healthcare quality and safety unit who will uh, direct it to the directorate of healthcare quality and safety and uh, then uh, uh, preventive actions can be taken all errors that are uh, we will get data on all errors that are happening then uh, we are talking about how to prevent errors so medication reconciliation is a process that is recommended to prevent errors this is another very important reason why errors occur is um, uh, is incorrect list of medicines uh, given to the patients. This can happen when the patients transfer from home coming to hospital. Patient might get admitted for a herniotomy um, and has hypertension and diabetes, but the house officer clerks uh, the main in, uh, the things on the herniotomy. It may not write the medicines that the patient is uh, needing for diabetes and hypertension. And then when you try to send the patient for surgery, uh, blood pressure may be too high and blood uh, sugar report might come um, uh, 300 and you may not be able to do the surgery. And then another thing that happens is in the medical wards, you might do many changes to your uh, uh, to the medicines that the patient is given in the ward, but those may not get reflected on discharge and on the discharge medication. Sometimes all only the medicines that the patient came in with may be written erroneously and then, uh, you know, many errors can occur. So, as I said, in other countries, there are clinical pharmacies, but here who, to check on these, but in our country, we don't have that. So it is your responsibility as doctors uh, who will be, um, who will have to check on the uh, medication reconciliation. Patient education is very important. I always tell my students, I think my many of my students must be here, right? I tell five important things to know, the minimum information, name of the drug, like, you know, that this is glibenclamide or metformin, strength of the tablet, like this is a 2.5 milligram, not as a half a tablet or one tablet, for what condition it is used, this is used for diabetes, how many times to take, that you have to take it uh, um, uh, twice a day or eight hourly, and how to use it, take it always with food or with a lot of water, things like that, right? These, these five important things you must tell, and then in addition, tell about uh, any possible side effects, like your blood sugar can go down, and if so, take something with sugar, you know, if you feel dizziness and palpitations and so on, and sweating uh, like that, and how to store, particularly for a drug like insulin, you know, you put it in the shelf of the fridge and things like that. So, how to improve the knowledge, we have found that if you write and give the patients, uh, particularly the drug, um, uh, the names of the medicines in their own language, like in Sinhalese or in Tamil um, written, the uh, knowledge improves to this level. So drug name by up to 73% indications, you can see every aspect has been improved, uh, whether you give it verbally or written, but much higher knowledge if you give it written in a piece of paper. And uh, so if you want to double check and uh, also know about the medicines, uh, you can use this student formulary. I think most of our uh, students from Colombo uh, knows about this, but this is a very useful uh, uh, book where we have included all patient advice to be given. And uh, the we have given a, in the appendix, I hope you have noted that in the appendix, we have list, given the list of most commonly prescribed 100 medicines that we have identified from a study. So if you know those 100 medicines, and those cover all five specialties, uh, medicine, surgery, obstetrics, gynae, pediatrics, and uh, psychiatry. So um, those 100 medicines are the most likely medicines that you will be prescribing. So learn about those. And we have given a list of high risk and high alert medicines also in this uh, student formula in the appendix. So, and then the information that you need to know about the medicines are in the book. So it will be very useful for you. If you are going to do some revision and then get ready uh, uh, to be an effective house officer, I would recommend uh, you to uh, read about, uh, read the uh, student formula. Uh, we have recommended this type of labeling, particularly after that, uh, you know, unfortunate incident where a, a child had paracetamol overdose. 
So uh, we are recommending uh, uh, that the labeling should be given in, in the patient's own language so that patients would know um, uh, what, type of, uh, med, uh, what type of a drug it is and then how to take it. But uh, implementation nationally is planned, but uh, you know it's a challenge. We have to see whether it can be implemented nationally. So in, for prevention, uh, actually World Health Organization has taken um, a major uh, step forward, which has actually, uh, you know, uh, disseminated into many countries. Uh, they launched medication safety as a as their third global patient safety challenge. They have launched two previous challenges. One is on safe surgery. The other one is on preventing healthcare associated infections. Um, and the th third challenge launched in 2017 was on medication safety. And the objective is to prevent severe harm due to medication errors by 50%. Uh, proposes we developed a national action plan on medication safety for Sri Lanka on the same, uh, you know, strategic uh, um, uh, objective of the uh, uh, WHO. And now, being uh, you know, various components are being implemented. We have, we are uh, last month we had uh, you know many meetings to identify a list of people like medicines, identify the high risk medicines, and to give. Uh, recommendations on how to handle it. So then final part of uh, my lecture is on prescription writing, how to get it right. So I have given you now various, uh, you know, errors that can occur. And let's see now how should we write a prescription. So a good prescription starts with a good medication history. And in fact, it is one of the most important aspects to um, ensure a safe and a um, rational prescription. It's called best possible medication history, BPMH. So you obtain a best possible medication history, which should include all other medical conditions the patient is having, including allergies, the current medications, what are they used for? Are they all needed? Are there any medicines that the patient is not really requiring? So you can omit them, uh, avoiding polypharmacy. Are there any possible interactions? Then any past medicines, if what were they given in the past? Why were they stopped? I have seen patients where uh, carbamazepine has been stopped because they developed uh, um, uh, uh, Steven Johnson syndrome. Five years down the line, another doctor has started carbamazepine and he developed a severe uh, another uh, Steven Johnson syndrome. So any side effects, allergies, which includes, uh, you know, over-the-counter medicines uh, uh, and the Ayurvedic preparations also where they can have, uh, you know, um, interactions. So, uh, so good prescribing, make a diagnosis or have a differential diagnosis. Do not write medicines, you know, just uh, thinking only of the symptoms. So avoid the practice of writing a medicine for every system. Prescribe ra rationally. Know what you're hoping to achieve with the therapy and critically evaluate the need for the medicine. Consider the evidence for efficacy and safety. You know this, you know, unfortunate situation where, you know, recently a 21-year-old healthy young girl who just got admitted for a diarrheal illness uh, died of anaphylaxis due to keftrioxone, right? So here, uh, you know, later, I, I mean, there were questions whether intravenous keftrioxone was really needed for this patient. It has been given because there has been a high CRP, but two grams of intravenous keftrioxone. So um, whether it was really needed uh, has been questioned. Um, so, so therefore, uh, I'm just telling this. It is not uh, to say that what, uh, what was given was wrong, but you must always consider the possibility of adverse effects when we are writing uh, medicines. If a particular uh, uh, medicine can be given orally, and uh, you know, consider that and consider whether a drug is really needed and know the patient's renal and liver functions. Get the dose right, right? And be clear on what is prescribed. Don't write a drug that you do not know about, right? Check on what the drug is. Sometimes some people come with a brand name. So ask what this brand name. Now you all have, you know, handheld, uh, um, you know, devices with which you can check um, uh, what the drug is. So, um, so therefore, uh, check on that and uh, uh, be clear on, um, uh, uh, on, on what is uh, uh, right clearly. 
legibility is, is critical and explain about the prescribed medicine. So you need to um, uh, uh, explain to the patient all the five things that I mentioned to you. Then, uh, so rational use of medicine, the definition is patients receive medicines to the appropriate to their clinical need in doses that meet their own requirement for an adequate time and at the lowest cost to them and the community. I'm sure you, you remember this definition that we have told you earlier. And so some tips on rational prescribing, don't start any medication without a clear indication and ask for the indication of any medicine that you are not sure of. Stop medicines if there is no rational indication identified and practice evidence-based medicine rather than eminence-based medicine, right? Uh, not because you see somebody else prescribing, but uh, prescribe only if you think that it is really needed. So I'm now uh, getting into the components of the prescription. There is a health ministry circular issued by the Director General of Health, uh, health Services, recent circular 2022. Uh, this actually, uh, this circular was issued following uh, um, again a, a patient death as a result of a, a medication error and a, a, a auditor general requesting the DGHS to take actions to prevent such uh, uh, issues. So uh, here, uh, the, the recommendations are all medicines shall be prescribed using the generic names to prevent errors. Indicate the correct dose, frequency of dosing and duration and the total amount to be issued. So, so, so say for example, you might, as and when needed like pain killing tablets, you might say a total of 10 tablets or 20 tablets like that. Write the correct name, age, gender and weight of the patient when it is for a child. So for a child, you have to write the weight as well. Write legibly, and uh, and sign and there is a recommendation to put your seal also for identification so uh, on the prescription so that if it goes to the farm when it goes to the pharmacist then if the pharmacist cannot make head or tail of what you have written then you can actually uh, uh, check with the uh, uh, doctor if the doctor is identified so maybe now in the uh, what we are saying is uh, use your personal seal uh, and maybe your consultants seal so that they know which uh, from which unit the prescription has been uh, issued then uh, the prescribing officer uh, should ensure minimum medicines information for treating the patient are prescribed uh, so that is um, uh, uh, the dose, the strength, the duration, route of administration, all that. Need to take into consideration the cost of medicines and prescribe in a cost-effective manner and advise the patients on the medicines prescribed, the name, indication, dose, how often, and special instructions on using the medicines and advice on adverse effects and storage whenever possible. So this is there in the ministry circular. So these are the things that you need to adhere to. And it also says what should be done to minimize prescribing errors involved with look-alike, sound-alike drugs. For that, minimize the use of verbal and telephone orders. So if you give uh, instruction over the phone, you know, somebody might hear it uh, differently and then give a wrong medicine or a wrong dose. So always with verbal orders, and it may be, it might happen even in an emergency situation also. You are managing a, you know, emergency and then you don't have time to write. You will be writing subsequently on the BHT. So there are the basic principle is read back or, uh, you know, so if, if somebody, if you want to tell uh, a nurse to, you know, give uh, one medicine, then you tell uh, that you, I want you to give adrenaline one in thousand intramuscularly like that. Right. And then the, whoever the, who is giving it should repeat it back. Okay. I am giving adrenaline one in thousand intramuscularly like that. Right. So uh, uh, like that, if you get the other person to repeat back, then the errors can be minimized. So if a consultant asks you to write something, give it verbally, you repeat back to make sure that you have got the uh, you know order correctly. So avoid using unapproved error prone abbreviations. And you can use what is called the stall man lettering uh, to, for clear identification, like metformin. If you think that this can be mistaken for methotrexate, you can write like this, some letters in capital or metaprolol like that, uh, which will be uh, clear. I think so this answers the question somebody asked about writing in capitals as well. So we, uh, what are the most common errors made? Dose errors were the most common in a study that we did, followed by drug name, 
for then frequency and then uh, uh, duration um, and uh, uh, there are various of dosage form and many other like drug du duplications and omissions and so on. So remember drug name and drug dose. Dose followed by name were the most common errors noted. And then we, uh, this, these are all errors noted by the, uh, identified by the pharmacist. And then we uh, uh, try to identify whether uh, it is um, the probability of that error reaching the patient. Uh, although most errors uh, were unlikely to reach the patient because nobody is likely to give, uh, you know, atenolol 500 milligrams if you, if you have written like 500 milligrams uh, without uh, knowing. Uh, but there were 59 errors where there was a high probability of that error reaching the patient. And then we looked at what is the probability of harm if it reached the patient. Although in most situations there was no harm or mild harm, there were 17 cases where the patient could have had severe harm or even uh, likely death as well. So therefore, um, please uh, uh, remember, every uh, medication error starts with your prescription, so you have to write it clearly. These are again the top 10 prescribing errors in the UK, omission, non-admission, wrong dose, no dose given, wrong formulation, and so on. So in writing a prescription, write the patient's name. Now here in other countries, they write the date of birth, but write the age of the patient always. I always, when I write a prescription, I write the age of the patient. Then medication, the name, the strength, right? The amount, frequency, and uh, uh, the rote per oral, how much uh, to be dispensed, like dispensed, like 30 uh, tablets, that's what's called refill. This is, you know, on the internet, which I just, uh, you know, put it down. So those are the various components that should be there in a prescription. And don't be an example of irrational prescribing. See, this is one of the uh, prescriptions that was, uh, you know, forwarded to me by one of the senior consultants. 21 medicines in the list. I was asked, are you all teaching your students to write like this, right? <laughs> so, uh, uh, so don't write like this. Patient takes only what he uh, wants. I think patient is more knowledgeable and more intelligent than the doctor who wrote it like this. So there, was, there are several drugs of the same drug class. If there is a prescription of this type, always, you know, if you are not confident uh, at the beginning, just check with your house uh, or your registrar or the consultant even whether you should write all these medicines if it is there in the previous uh, prescription. So in summary, Legible writing is critical because many medication errors are due to poor legibility. Correct the dose, frequency, duration uh, for the patient. Advise the patient uh, and including any special instructions. Consider the safety, very uh, important, any possible adverse effects, contraindications and so on. Monitor for side effects and do not write repeat all. That's another very uh, common mistake that you all do. Uh, repeat all. Don't write repeat all. Always write the same uh, uh, prescription. Um, again so that you will note the uh, issues. So finally, recommendations for practice. Again, write legibly using generic names, avoid polypharmacy, so that is prescribing rationally. Take medication histories carefully, including allergies, best possible medication history. Know the high-risk medicines for adverse effects. I have given many high-risk medicines. Be familiar with the common medicines that you are going to prescribe. Look at the uh, uh, commonly prescribed medicines, 100 medicines, and uh, be uh, you know, aware of those 100 medicines, the common doses, and so on. Use formularies to double-check BNS student formulary or online. Communicate things clearly to the other members of the uh, staff. Develop your checking habits of five rights. Report and learn from medication events. If you see even a near miss, you can use the reporting form. Have good communication with pharmacists and nurses because they are part of the uh, team. Have good communication with them because be and also be humble if an error is noted and clarified. Don't go to fight with them. Right? So in finally, to a is human. And people say the direct and the Pope said, forgive, forgive uh, is divine. But to err is human, to admit is superhuman. And if you learn and prevent an error, I think you are a superb human. So prescribing is important and it must be taken seriously and must be given the time and care that your patient deserves. Thank you very much. I'm happy to answer any questions if you have. Thank you, Madam, for that uh, detailed comprehensive lecture on prescription prescribing. Uh, 
we have a bit of a time issue, but we will take the questions up uh, because we will not break for tea. So, um, yeah, if there are any if questions, there are questions, please unmute or you can use the chat box to uh, ask. Yeah. When I'm supposed to have the MCQ, somebody is asking. Anyway. Yeah, I think in the interest of time, probably, uh, yes, uh, we can uh, stop this uh, uh, lecture. So, thank you very much. Uh, uh, right. Uh, thank you very much, madam. That was uh, Dr. Professor Preda Chanikalapatri, Professor in Pharmacology. Thank you, madam, for guiding the new interns on this rationally prescribed and all the details with regard to that. So, uh, uh, at the meantime, our next lecture is uh, by Deputy Director General of ENOH, uh, is by uh, Dr. <coughs> Gamla, Dr. Gamla, so he's on the team. So, over to you, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I hope uh, you can hear me. Yeah, we can hear you, sir. Can we move? Don't, uh, know, whether, one and don't two, know whether people are fed up and now and uh, they need a small break. They're fully trained, sir. So no. <laughs> fully trained. Two weeks okay. Yes. Uh, in fact, uh, my lecture is on responsiveness, patient-centered care, and positive attitudes. And Dr. Galapati was explaining uh, where and uh, what could be, what could go wrong. And uh, my lecture would be on if you do something wrong, what will happen to you? That's basically a uh, management lecture. So uh, responsiveness, patient-centered care, positive attitudes are three different lectures, lectures each consuming uh, nearly about two hours, but I, I, I have compiled all of them together. So it will be a very shortened version of this, uh, these three topics. And uh, so I am late by 20 minutes. So I will take uh, those 20 and uh, almost 30 minutes. So I will uh, take those uh, 30 minutes from the end. That means I will probably uh, finish my lecture around 12.30. So, uh, remember, now, uh, once you enter the government service as a doctor or anybody in the government service, uh, you are governed by uh, so many laws. Now, as of today, you are a citizen of this country and you are governed by set of laws uh, like this law of the land, maybe the penal code, the traffic laws, and that kind of things. We all are ab abide by these uh, laws. The police will uh, take action on these things. If you violate the traffic laws or penal code, you will be taken to police or something like that. So that is how so far you had been enjoying life. But mind you, from today onwards, by today onwards, I mean the moment you uh, start your career, maybe next week, you will be governed by two additional laws. One is the department law. That is written in the establishment code. If you have time, now you can go and read. You can download it from the, uh, the pub, pub, public administration uh, department website. And uh, that, it has two volumes. One is uh, all sorts of... Uh, how, how you do all sort of this uh, government procedures to do and things like that. Uh, the other part is a uh, code, of, code of conduct uh, and uh, the, the punishment and all that. So the authority for implementing this, uh, the provisions of the establishment code is the Public Service Commission, where your appointments, promotion and disciplinary actions are being taken. So there's another, another body, what is, uh, the Sri Lanka Medical Council will look into your professional ethics. So, Professor Garapath was mentioning somebody uh, somewhere went wrong and uh, the patient complained to the Sri Lanka Medical Council. So, they, they conduct inquiry and uh, their ethical guidelines. If you violate those guidelines, uh, the maximum thing could happen is that your, your 
registration could be erased. So therefore, today, if you assault a person, only the police will be in action. But tomorrow, if you do the same thing, the department law and the, the professional ethics as Sri Lanka Medical Council will come against you. Even if you do something wrong in, in the society, remember, you assault somebody in the society, that is regarded as an offense under the establishment court. If something you something you do which violates the penal code, something like assault, then uh, as per the establishment code, you can, uh, in fact, you can be uh, interdicted and initiate inquiry. And uh, if somebody complains to the SLMC, this person assaulted somebody in a village, then the SLMC can take uh, action uh, on professional ethics. So uh, therefore, be mindful. Uh, you are governed by all these three sets of laws from the day you start your career. Then remember that the, as a medical officer, especially as an intern medical officer, you, are, you have different roles to play. First is a receptionist role. So you know what receptionists do. You have to welcome the patient in the ward not, we won't ask you to welcome saying I want, but the way you welcome the patient, the, how you, I don't know whether you smile at patients, which should be done, or how you talk to the patient and how you accommodate the patient. Uh, at the first instance, the patient takes an, takes an idea about what sort of a ward this is, what sort of people are uh, in this ward. So as a medical officer, especially as a, a intern medical officer, you are a receptionist. Then you are a clinician. Essentially, you need to know your staff, the, the technical staff, and uh, how to, how to uh, treat your patient. I think you know all this by now, but we have observed, uh, I, I, I couldn't tell you that, uh, now I'm retired, I'm not the, not the DDG uh, ENOH anymore. Uh, after 35 years of service, I started as a medical officer of health, MOH. I have worked as DMO, hospital directors, RDHS, uh, training sector, campaigns, you name, you name any field, I have worked there and finally came to the Minister of Health as a director and deputy director general and retired as a DDG. So in my experience, I have seen, even now I am, I am uh, witnessing our doctors have enough clinical sense and knowledge, but they are lack what they are lacking is common sense. That's what these errors you just mentioned, you just heard now are happening because they lack common sense. That's not your fault. That may be the fault of the, the education system that we are all less Texas type uh, 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 learners. And therefore uh, it's, it's, it's uh, very difficult to grasp this uh, sometimes uh, the, 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 the our people, are, uh, our doctors are lacking common sense. A lot of errors are happening in the in the uh, hospitals and even outside hospitals uh, because of that. So the remember, you are a, a legal officer as well. When a patient comes to the ward and you need to have a little bit of suspicion, especially with injuries and children, this can be some sort of, there can be some sort of uh, medical legal implications in this. Women and children, you have to be careful uh, in examining and taking histories. They will not divulge, but uh, you need to be mindful and uh, mindful and uh, look around certain uh, things, uh, just like a police officer, uh, to be vigilant that there may be some sort of uh, uh, legal uh, implications uh, in your case you are looking at. Then you are essentially a counselor. Your patient comes with problems. There may be clinical problems. Invariably with the clinical problem, they have mental, you know, the stress and agony. Uh, so therefore, uh, talk to the patient. Talking to the patient alone, smiling alone can help uh, to, to uh, help them a lot. Uh, so therefore, uh, you are a counselor and you are a communicator as well. So these are so important, how you communicate verbally 
and written communication was mentioned in the previous lecture and verbal communication as well. So we have seen some, especially the consultants, sometimes go on the word round, never talk to the patient, ask about the patient from the junior doctors. How this patient is, what is this, never touch the patient. So it's very important for doctors to touch the patient, talk to patients and communicate effectively with them. Then half of their disease is gone. And so pre be prepared to play all these roles. And you are, as a doctor, is a wider role, especially as a junior doctor, you will have to play the roles of all these uh, areas. Next, what is expected from the medical profession? So remember, one second. Remember whatever your social background and the status you were in from today onwards, you belong to the medical profession. You may be from different profession, your mother and father may be, I don't know, maybe business or no, wherever, but from today onwards, you belong to the once uh, very well respected medical profession. Why I say once very well respected, nowadays medical profession is not respected. You know that. As a doctor, if you want the respect, you need to individually earn it. You will not be respected by being a doctor. Remember that. If you behave the way the, the a doctor should behave, then you will be respected individually, but doctors as a whole are not respected anymore. You know why the reason is also. The government, society, and patients expect due professionalism from you, from whatever you do. So the government expects certain things, the department expects certain things, society and the patients expect certain professionalism in your clinical expertise, the behavior, attire, communication, and interaction with others. So essentially, they expect clinical expertise from you, and the patients will never expect that you will do, do something wrong to patients. So therefore, that is their expectation you need to fulfill. Then there's, there should be a decent behavior. Patients are patients. They are in agony. They are in pain. So if they lose temper, if the doctor also lose temper, then you are not a good professional. You should know that they are out of their home, out of their loved ones, and in a stressful situation, and you need to help them rather than shouting at them. So attire is very important. And uh, sometimes uh, when we happen to go to the hospitals in the evening, when we see doctors, because they are, the stethoscope is around uh, their neck, we think that they are doctors. Otherwise, sometimes we think that they are beggars coming into the hospital looking for food. The attire is so poor. So please be mindful that, that whenever in the hospital have a decent, decent uh, attire, what is called a smart casual, to suit your profession. You may have come from different, different backgrounds, but now you belong to this profession. So don't repeat what you had been doing from childhood in, the, in, in your locality, so uh, at home. So once uh, I was a hospital director, uh, I, uh, in the morning, usually almost every day, I go on rounds in the wards. In turn, doctor, a lady doctor, I, uh, I, I happen to see in the ward. She was wearing a blouse, is little better than a mosquito net. So inside there, there was only the bra. So in fact, I was Fabagaso to see what she was wearing. So I asked her, are, are you aware what you are wearing? And I asked her to immediately go to the, uh, go to the quarters and come in a decent attire. So I don't know why people are, people don't think that they are in a, in a profession and they should protect the dignity of the profession. So if they don't have a dignity, at least they should protect the dignity of the profession. 
so therefore please be mindful of your attire and uh, and uh, your hair style so you can have a beard but be a be a decent person at all the time that then only people will start respecting people like that communication with this verbal communication or a written communication that's uh, important to have a proper communication which suits your profession interaction with both up and down your superiors your 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 uh, your subordinates all you should have your sympathy and empathy which is expected out of your profession as a as a doctor in fact uh, i'm in a group uh, where a lot of uh, medical doctors are medical i think maybe maybe medical uh, administrators so i usually see uh, one person who is uh, communicating the moment he start uh, writing something in this whatsapp group he, he always start the effort for letter word and uh, all the all the communication in the in his uh, in his comment is all fill the words so in fact i was wondering whether is a doctor if he is a doctor his father would have been definitely a definitely a fishmonger malukar ekennadi mother would have been a prostitute so therefore don't show if you are from that fam- that kind of a uh, the, the, the if somebody is from that kind of a family he should not show it to the others and remember that you you belong to this profession uh, the noble profession of uh, uh, doctors so that please keep that in mind in the rest of your life you need to uh, you need to have a behavior whether you are inside the hospital or outside or in the social media to suit our profession and uh, and that's very important so coming to uh, attitudes uh, attitudes play a very important role in your life so you are where where you are today in your life because of your attitudes one day you decided that i will work hard to go to this situation therefore you are here your friends who were in the school in your class thought oh i can i can i can do this uh, study i will have a joyful life uh, and they are in their uh, due places today so you are here as a as a doctor qualified doctor today about to start your career because of your positive attitudes so similarly you will go somewhere in your life in future because of the same attitudes if you develop this attitude good attitudes you will be landed somewhere positive still is possible if you change your attitudes to negative ones criticizing ones then you will be even if you are a doctor you will not be not be going to a good place so therefore attitudes are so important which will take your life to a higher level or the other the other way as well so in the next few slides i am uh, going to give you certain uh, little bit information about your uh, about your uh, manage managerial aspects of your Uh, duty here i am going to tell you uh, how much time you sacrifice as a doctor for for uh, you are in, in your hospital say there are 365 days uh, for for uh, a year and uh, you will be working uh, probably at uh, 300 days uh, out, uh, when you deduct uh, what i am what i am talking uh, to you is uh, only the active duty Uh, you are working for your salary other than the off days overtime uh, one pay tenth and all that so you have to uh, after after your internship you will have 49 days of leave then uh, you deduct it you will be working only 250 251 days you have short leave all together 6 uh, days in a year you deduct it then you count to 245 days of work out of 365 so that comes to 1 uh, 1960 hours of work and uh, there are 8760 hours per year and you will be doing active service for uh, for the hospital only 22% of the time if you sleep 
eight hours a day, you will be sleeping 33% of your time. So you are doing active work for 22% of your time, whatever additional work you will be paid extra. This is the calculation of your work time. For this 22% of your time, what you will be getting is your salary. So you will get your salary and go and just see whether you are doing all this, feeding your family or parents if you are not married, children's education, I don't think you still have children, maintain your parents, treatment for illnesses, entertainment, build a house and vehicle. Of course, the last two uh, you can't do with your family, with your, with your uh, salary, but uh, you take even a loan because of your uh, government job. If you are not a, uh, if you're not employed in the government sector uh, with a, with a, this much of salary, you will not be uh, able to get even a private loan. So therefore, you are doing all this with the salary and are you aware that other than salary, there are some benefits for you waiting just after your internship, you are, uh, in fact, uh, you'll be getting quarters just now, but after internship, you will have all these, the railway warrants, the Agrahara insurance, where when you are hospitalized, you are paid when you, for, uh, for your uh, glasses, they pay. Uh, then uh, you will be uh, getting uh, maternity leave, both mother and father will be getting uh, maternity leave. Then there will be a distress loan if you are in distress. Uh, uh, within one month, they pay you what is called 10 months salary as a, as a uh, distress loan. Then uh, their property loan with, with a very minimum, uh, minimum uh, interest rate. So there are circuit bungalows all around the country. You can go and uh, stay there for a very minimum uh, rate. Then uh, you are getting paying board facilities free of charge uh, uh, for all the staff officers uh, get this facility. So these are uh, some. Of, these are some of the uh, uh, some of the uh, benefit that uh, you get uh, by being a doctor. So in fact, doctors get uh, more than this car permits and all that. So uh, the salary, these benefits, and other than that. Are you getting anything else from the government service? Usually people blame the government service that they don't get much. Private, private sector, they have better salaries. But uh, mind you that uh, the, the benefits are much better in the government sector. So when you are in trouble, so whether the government could help you, yes, there's what is called accident leave. You may not have heard of it. Please remember this. The moment you leave from the, uh, from the, from your home until you get back to your home, you are covered with this accident leave. If something happens on the road and uh, you need leave, uh, the, the department gives you accident leave for any amount of time, any amount of period without deducting from your due leave. So in my career as hospital director, for a person I gave you, gave him uh, one year of, uh, because he met with an accident on the way uh, 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 to the hospital, and one year of fully paid leave without deducting from his uh, leave. So, so, so as a uh, permanent employer, once you finished your internship, you are entitled for this. Then of course, uh, there's a lot more time for you to retire, but at the time of retirement, you get uh, gratuity, which uh, as a doctor, you will get uh, around 2 million rupees uh, as of the current day calculation. So you get, after that, you get the pension, uh, pension uh, for life until you die. Now, uh, in our country, uh, those days, uh, the people retire at the age of uh, 55. Now it is uh, 60. And uh, people usually work uh, around 30 years. And there are people who uh, get the pension for 40, 50 years after his retirement. I have given in the, on the right side, right? you go to the pensions website, pensions.go.lk, and just check the people who are getting the pension. And the top in the list, there's one person called Shambhugaraja. He had uh, 
retired in uh, uh, I think nine, 1969 he has retired still drawing the pension so maybe uh, maybe that uh, I don't know if he's living but if he's not living his uh, his uh, wife is entitled for the uh, for the pension so that's the that's the kind of uh, kind of uh, this thing that uh, that's why most of the people come to the government service because of this pension and uh, even uh, after your death if you have a disabled child the, the disabled child will get your pension so uh, government never say you have worked for 30 years uh, more than that we can't pay until you die they pay the pension so retirement on medical grounds, what will happen on, the, they say you are now working as a, as a doctor in the hospital, if some, for some reason you cannot work anymore for medical grounds. So at that time, what will happen is that uh, there'll be medical board and if the medical board recommends, you will get the pension for life. So that are, those are some of the uh, things uh, that uh, we, you are, uh, and there are many more. So if there's a sudden death while on duty, so while on duty, if a person dies, he will get the sixty month. He will get sixty months salary as a compensation. Now this sixty month was in fact recently increased to one hundred twenty months. Just calculate if your salary is say fifty thousand and one hundred twenty, how much would it be? Maybe uh, close upon close upon ten million. So uh, these are uh, in fact uh, the schemes that uh, the uh, government, uh, any government officer is uh, entitled for. Then uh, once, the, once the person is dead, the salary will be paid to the, uh, the dependents until uh, his age reach 55 if he was living. So the, the, the officer is now dead, but, the, but his salary, not the pension, he will get uh, 120 months of salary. So the, 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 not he, the, the dependents will get the 120 months of salary. Plus, they will get the salary of the deceased person as well. Then, after 55, they will get the pension of the deceased officer. If there's a disabled child, he or she will get the pensions for life. Maybe that may be the reason that Mr. Samu Raja is getting. Not, maybe not him his uh, disabled child may be getting. Uh, and uh, on top of that, if the pe person dies while on duty, all loans paid by the government, uh, the, in fact, uh, all the loans, uh, the arrears of the loans will be paid by the government. The two loans that the, the, the vehicle loan, if you got, got the vehicle loan or the property loan or 10 month loan here, yes, but that will be paid by the government. And uh, uh, two years ago, there was another circular uh, saying that uh, he will get, a, he or she will get a promotion as well. So these are the things uh, if a government officer uh, suddenly dies while on duty. Uh, so if you, uh, then there, if there's a natural death while on duty, it's not a sudden death, natural death by on duty. He or she will get a death gratuity, which is 24 months of salary. And the rest is the same. The dependents will get the salary for 55 years, under 55 years. And after 55 years, the, the, the pension. Then uh, the rest is the same. If there is a complete permanent disability, both eyes got damaged, no vision at all, both... Uh, uh, hearing uh, get lost totally something like that all the uh, all these things will be paid as if the the person died if there's a partial disability that is uh, one eye one ear something like that then uh, the person will get 45 months uh, salary as a uh, compensation and uh, salary for dependents for 55 until 55 years and the rest is the same if it is a temporary partial disability he will get uh, 10 months salary as a compensation so uh, you see that uh, these all are given only for the government officers no no 
uh, private sector could afford to do this. You might sometimes see that in the, in the private sector, less qualified people get a better salary than you. But uh, remember that this is a this uh, pension and this disability scheme. There's a special circular out, uh, which is called the disability, uh, uh, no, no, it's called the, uh, I forget the name, uh, <coughs> sorry. Compensation uh, circular issued by the public, uh, public administration department. And, uh, and mind you that uh, the pensions department is now, now uh, computerized and very efficient. And you will get all these things uh, uh, with, with many minimum delays. Of course, these days there's a little bit of uh, financial issues. Otherwise, there's no delay at all. You all are entitled for all this. So why this? Why does the government do this? So when the when the when the when the officer dies, why the government look after the family until they are death? If there's a disabled child until they are death, so this is what is called the dignity of the government service. The government service does not like the say uh, to see that uh, that uh, if the person the the wife of a deceased. Uh, Grammar that is begging on the road. The government doesn't like to see uh, that people saying that that's the government that is wife who is begging because that's that's a disgrace to the to the government from the government professions. So therefore, don't measure the dignity of the of the uh, government uh, service by the pay that you get at the end of the month on the twenty fifth. There is a lot more waiting if something goes wrong in your family. And this is a, this is a program to look after uh, you and your family if something major happens to your family. So uh, then I will come to the uh, responsiveness, uh, how to be responsive. So what is responsiveness? The responsiveness is when you fulfill the expectation of others, so when you fulfill the expectation of others, that is responsiveness. Who are these others? So before going to patients, look at your family. So if you are married, your spouse. So I have a separate lecture on this, how to, how to treat the spouse, children, and uh, how to uh, treat your work. But I don't have enough time. Uh, so in short, uh, usually I should say in these uh, lectures, who is the most valuable person in your life? I, I used to ask this question. Most ladies used to answer their children. Then I asked them, who gave you the children? So it's definitely your, your, your husband. So the husband should be, or the wife should be placed in the first place in your, in your life. Of course, as young people nowadays, you, you do that, but later on you forget it. So, uh, so these are the priorities in life. First, your spouse, second children, third, your work. So if you, if you can fulfill the expectation of all these, you are a responsible guy, a responsible person. So let me tell you a little bit about uh, how you do this. How do you treat your spouse? You have to give three things. Have you heard of this anywhere? Love, care, and sex. So these things you have to uh, give. Should I tell you how? How do you give love? This is how you give love. Touch, talk, and work. So when you when you are in love, I I, I always tell. When, I, I never say when you are in love, you should be in love with all the time with all the persons. Uh, but at least with your spouse, this is how you give love. Touch, talk, and walk. So. During the medical college, yes, if you had a had a partner, this is what you did. Uh, holding the hands, talking and walking in the beach or somewhere. So you need to do this for life. That's how you should show. You should show. When you are very old, anyway, then you have to hold the hand, prevent uh, falling. But even before that, uh, you do need to do this how? How frequently daily? Quality in a romantic way. 
are you doing this? So touching means touch uh, uh, in, in, in different forms. Maybe touching the hands uh, or kissing and all that is, is touching. So ensure that you, did, you do this for your spouse daily for life. If it is video, tedious, tedious, that is better, much better. So uh, that is love. Care. How do you give care? So uh, frequent little, little things go a long way. Giving something for the birthday. When he or she is ill, how to look after her. When she, when he is ill, just don't ask his parent don't let the kaamali aram bono ko karadar karan So don't don't say like that. To take two paracetamol into your hands and take some water and give to your husband help make a bonda on the week. So that that those things matter a lot. When the wife is ill, you stay at home, help her cooking. If he can, if he, if he's very ill, feed her. And these things go a long way. So these are these are literally little things caring. When we when you are in relation with somebody, we usually call it you open an account in the other person's heart and you fill fill that account with little little good things. So when you do good things to her, she will fill that account on behalf of you. When you do good thing to him, he will he will fill the account, your account with these things. So frequently you do a lot of these things, both accounts will be filled. So there, then there won't be nothing to worry. When you, when you have a fight, definitely you have a fight. You have to have fights among yourself in the, in, the, in the married life. Little bit of is withdrawn from this account. But if you have a lot, nothing to worry. But if you have little, this drawing might end up in, 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 uh, in divorces. So make sure that you fill your other person's account in the heart to the fullest. So little, little, uh, uh, little, little quarrels here and there will, will not do any harm. So you have heard this uh, term, uh, the, the, in Sinhala, we call it Denna uh, Dimalange. Randu Bathalia then come with the Ikea. It's not the Bathalia until you need the third one. Uh, you you have these quarrels. The the moment uh, uh, you need it, the quarrel is over. So the uh, that is care as often as of, uh, often as uh, possible. And how do you give it? You give it genuinely, uh, genuinely uh, the way he or she feels it. Sex, of course, is a is a is a natural thing. Not not for people. Everybody, uh, every animal, uh, is uh, designed to have this. But the rule there is: if and when, where, how one wants. If when other person wants it, when, where, how, you just uh, obey. If do if you don't have a uh, reason valid reason uh, to object when, where, and how the other person wants, you just align with it if you don't have a valid reason. And usually people say, whenever the male person wants it, the female always has a headache. Uh, but if you really had, has, has a headache, it's okay. Or some other, uh, other genuine reason that's okay but uh, not to have it uh, regularly or as a habit. This, this applies both ways, both for males and females. So it should be fulfilled when both wants it. And you know, there are third, three stages. I need not to tell you as doctors, you know that. So out of these uh, three, love, care, and sex, what is the most important? So since this is not a physical lecture, I can't ask you. All three are equally important. You can't say this is this is this is uh, this. I want more than that. Certain stages, certain things may be more important. But remember, these things maintain these things for life, and all these three things are equally important. 
and also remember and also remember that you come to love not by finding the perfect person but by seeing an imperfect person perfectly you selected this person as your partner because you liked him or her but later on definitely you will you will detect certain uh, imperfections and uh, mismatches but don't blame him or her why because that's your choice one day you you selected him or her but usually your selection later on you you might realize that your your selection is wrong because when you are in love that's why that's what is called you are blind because when you, the love is blind you will not these imperfections when you are in love but after one or two years of marriage only you will see that oh there are certain things i didn't see that's not her fault that's not his fault that is your fault you are the one who was blindly in love so therefore that was your choice uh, with all these perfections uh, live a successful life with him or her every one has these uh, imperfections one or two one or two imperfections here and there you will never see a perfect person in your life wherever you go sometimes i have seen there are so many stories to tell but i don't have enough time but i will tell you one thing i have seen one one uh, actual when i was uh, working in a remote place when I was a very wealthy person had a very good wife a very beautiful wife but for some reason after about 2 years he uh, he divorced from because he had some affair with some other other girl and uh, he divorced this wife and uh, married a, a second uh, wife uh, which uh, he had uh, an affair for some time and having spent another 2 3 years with this new wife uh, later the what this the old wife this wife uh, did not marry she was living alone and he wanted to divorce the new wife and come back to the old wife so the true story I, i happened to see in kurunagar so why this happened because everybody has imperfection when you are in the in the love with for the second time you see you don't see the imperfection because again the second love is blind then you judge both wise and the later you decide who oh, what her this is the previous how how good she the previous wife was so therefore there is another reason for this i have another lecture on uh, free birth there i i explained that but i don't have time to explain that reason here so therefore you will find so many uh, outside you you will compare uh, uh, the bark of the tree with the co of your your wife or the husband inside you will see the outer side of the other people in the society you think that is a better better choice but when you when you look look in the co only you will see no it's not like that <clears throat> uh, that's a bit of uh, advice for uh, your personal life so remember identify the priorities in life uh, the spouse and children children how to manage children is another lecture but i am not going to into detail now but third is your job so i told you how to treat your spouse how how to treat your job Uh, when i ask people in physical lectures they say you have to come in time do your job correctly and all that kind of things to be punctual and all that but i always say you ask your conscience look look in the mirror with the you are doing the correct job to the correct correct way if you are satisfied at the end of your the day at the end of the month at the end of your career you have won the life so ask your conscience do you heard the saksing hand whether i i i i do a correct i have seen in fact in the in the colombo big hospital one consultant told me his uh, 
is the doctors never reported for months, but still drawing the salary and overtime as well. So what will your conscience tell you? So please remember, you are you are in a in a sacred place. I'll explain that later. And uh, what you do in your place matter a lot to your personal life. I will come to that later. So uh, responsiveness as a doctor, you deliver what the patient expect from you as a doctor. What what patients expect you expect from you as a doctor? Only two things: alleviate suffering, pain, distress, and fear. So whatever the illness, they come with uh, these things: pain, distress, and fear. So, so they, they expect alleviate from suffering and relief from the disease, cure or manage the patient in a way, in such a way that the condition will not be a major issue. Either treat or send him home or treat or refer to the clinic. So here I could uh, tell you one story. Uh, uh, there was one uh, professor, uh, Professor Kodagado, you have heard of, the Colombo people should know. Uh, he got a heart attack way back maybe about 20, 20, 25 years ago. And he was ab- admitted to the cardiology unit uh, in the in the NHSL. And uh, he was surrounded by the eminent cardiologists and the doctors. And uh, almost all of them happened to be his students. So he uh, recovered the uh, heart attack and came home and he uh, came to a TV interview and told in this interview, uh, I have uh, I have treated thousands of patients, uh, but when I was in this bed, I realized, I realized uh, in, in Singhala, he said, So what, what is meant by helplessness in a patient. So as a professor of medicine, uh, when he is surrounded by most eminent doctors, still he felt helpless. So nothing to say about your patients who are in your beds. So they feel it very badly, whether I'm going to die, whether I'm going to and what to suffer, whether I could go back to home. So they are they are suffering uh, from not only the physical pain, but also uh, mentally. So if you can relieve this both, that, uh, that, but that's what the responsiveness is. So you'll be responsive. So you all do all this too with all this dignity, confidentiality, attention, quality of care, freedom of choice and trust. So you need to examine the patient, protecting their dignity. You know that you have been taught confidentiality. You need not to tell it to others. You have been told this. Enough attention. That's what I told you. Always talk to patient, smile with them, and just tell one word or two. What Just tell them what you are going to do. You'll be doing this test tomorrow. So just explain it. There's a lot to them when they hear it from a doctor, not from a nurse. So the quality of care, the freedom of choice. So the usually our people don't offer it. When somebody wants a family planning method, just say, you take this and go and do it. So I'm going to do this and just sign here. No, the patient should have the choice even in the medicines. In our, in our country, this is not, this is not seen, but even uh, you, you, you go beyond our boundaries, you will see that in any care, the uh, doctor asks the patient, these are the options, these are the pros and cons. Uh, what would you like? So the patient is given the choice for, the, for, for certain, certain instances to choose from. And the trust. So from all these, the, the patient should develop trust uh, with the doctor. So all these things uh, should be uh, the, the, the responsiveness is that provide the uh, alleviate suffering and uh, give a relief to the 
the for the disease with all these qualities so uh, coming to uh, once again uh, if you if you treat your spouse the way he or she be treated your children the way they are should be treated invariably you will come to the hospital and do the patient uh, the whatever the care the way they need so remember there are only two places you have to look after in life that is your home where your loved ones are there the spouse and your children and the second place is your job where you earn and feed them remember even if you do a private practice you do it because of the because of the knowledge and experience to get from the country and from the department and from the uh, uh, from the people of this country so therefore uh, you you have the obligation to treat your patient uh, with a dignity so if you are a good husband and a good wife at home if you are a good father and a mother at home you are a good, invariably you are a good doctor in the in the hospital so this we call in singala anto jata bhai jata if you are if you are good inside in your personal life inside within you you are invariably a good doctor if not you have to develop a lot so why the resp responsiveness matters because the people of this country educated you it's not not only you everybody even the clerk was, uh, was educated by the country but especially a lot of money was spent on you they spent for your health they are paying for your salary government is not paying for you the government collects salary from the others and government only manages the funds so it's paid by the people of the country and uh, the parents of the, the, the remember the parents of the pe people who are lying in your beds paid for your education and their children will pay pay for your pension please remember this their parents paid for your education and they probably and they, their children will pay for your pension so you have the right uh, to treat them uh, and cure them and whatever uh, treatment be given to their, to their expectation so but when you go to the hospital you will mostly see the bad examples you were dakna me makkal only we pay a little salary that is also uh, tax now when uh, don't don't be here go up don't know all negative things in the society especially these days but listening to this, those things whether you are not going to perform your duty is up to you be your own driver in life with your conscience obage her the sakshi tan obe oparaj karya kara rather than blame in the darkness you can light a candle in your own place then at least that place will be will be enlightened so when i, I when i was when the the, the, the director of the andradpur hospital i improved the hospital uh, there were 16 uh, units and when i left the hospital there were 30 units neuro, neurosurgery you will see if you go to andradpur hospital neurosurgery and neuro, the, the cardiology then the the the, the called the renal unit all started by me i kept something there and keep so even one person can do wonders you as a as a inter medical officer can enlighten your ward so uh, when i was the kego director kego hospital we won the uh, the gold award for the best hospital in sri lanka in 2010 when i was the director of the nihs the first ever who collaboration center was started here only training center accredited by who in the country uh, the, the, the first and only one at that time then uh, one other center came in the, uh, the uh, medical faculty uh, colombo so 
you get something out of out of this uh, job that is uh, for service you get the salary you will get the experience you will get the dignity so keep something for the for the system as well and leave before you leave the system so that will keep your name in the, in 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 the, those uh, uh, those places and the and, and the 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 minds of the people so therefore rather than blaming the darkness you will have enough 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 things to blame these days but blaming them are you going to not not to perform your duty also to the expectations of the pe- people or the patients then you also will fail in life these are the people who will pay you a salary so when they buy a loaf of bread when they buy a bottle of uh, kerosene some the portion is taken to the government that's what uh, that's what uh, comes into your salary on the 25th of every month so therefore uh, patient centered care is something going beyond the responsiveness when i am reading out uh, these things you might feel these are alien to our health system but remember if you go out of this territory especially to places like europe and japan and uh, you will see these are golden rules in medical practice so therefore at least remember these things patient centered care is about respecting patients preference and diversity and not all patients are like people have their beliefs different religions so respect these things if somebody wants some some patient <coughs> sorry some patients relation relatives want to do some chanting in the ward i love it it some other other religion uh, uh, person uh, needs to come to the uh, your your uh, patients beside and pray i love it so respect their preferences and diversity it includes patients right to comment ask questions and make complaints about the health care they have the right to complain if they don't get the the expected uh, expected uh, uh, care so nowadays uh, in fact people very rarely complain but there are some people who are very smart go and complain to several places including uh, including the uh, human right commission and uh, we have seen doctors in trouble so elements that affect the way health system and facilities are designed and managed and the way uh, ki is designed unfortunately there are very few uh, hospitals in our country as designed and hospitals like you know there are the pro hospital uh, the peradini hospitals are designed as hospitals many of the other hospitals are just buildings converted into hospitals so most of these places are not patient friendly but still we we need to uh, uh, think of the expectations of the patient say something like the the, the the icu should be very uh, close to the critical wards uh, things like that so uh, the places that you cannot manage in certain uh, certain hospital there are certain issues in uh, these arrangements the care is collaborative coordinated and accessible the right care is provided at the right time and the, at the right place so i don't know if this is that happening those days uh, it was happening especially in the icus every day all the consultants come together and discuss about the patient and it's a coordinated approach toward the patient even in the wards so the the care should be given at the right and at the, at the right place and uh, we have seen nowadays that patients are taken all over the all over the hospital to be shown to consultants so this in fact came i think in 1980s or somewhere before that this never happened when i did my internship in national hospital uh, about maybe 35 years ago uh, no no patients were taken outside the outside the wards to be shown to any other consultant other than for radiology or, or scanning all the consultants used to come to the hospitals and see the patient on consultants not even registrar used to come there is nothing called referral from mo to mo even from senior registrar to senior registrar so i could remember my consultant uh, the when i did the, the internship uh, she was dr mrs somarisilla 
and uh, she used to tell tell us if i am not at 8 o'clock in the ward either i am on leave or i am dead so she kept that word always before 8 o'clock she is in the ward and she the, she never leaves uh, before 12 o'clock from the ward so you used to look at look out a patient give advice teach the registrars teach the doctors and all that so she leaves uh, after 12 o'clock then exactly at 2 o'clock she is back at, at uh, back in the ward and until 4 o'clock she is there so i don't know how many consultants do it now i don't blame anybody i am not finding fault with them but this was the quality at that time they uh, refer a patient to the uh, to another consultant and if that consultant cannot see because maybe he is in the clinic or in, in the theater he will send his uh, most senior doctor registrar somebody go and have a look patient and come back and tell me what it is and i will tell what to do not you so and tell the patient i will I'll just start the theater i will come to the ward and see the patient so it's only between the consultants and consultant the referral was only between consultant and consultant and uh, even in the night they used to come so there are some uh, consult very uh, the, the consultant is still practicing like like that and they are very good assets to patient i know one one consultant like that he always uh, a pediatrician when i was director he always used to come to the hospital when he is called and uh, the other this thing was that uh, i think during 199 not to uh, i don't know maybe I don't know the time. I, 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 when I was the director in that hospital, consultants were given the overtime, but this particular consultant never claimed any overtime. Although he routinely comes to the hospital, he used to say it's only one, one hour or two hours. But I don't want to. I don't want to claim. So all other consultants came against him uh, because he was not claiming, but still he did not claim. So this is the kind of policy that uh, the very good doctors maintain. so at the at the same time uh, i heard the other side of the story uh, there was one one youngest professor to be called uh, i don't know where he is uh, and uh, somebody was saying yeah, she is the youngest professor medical professor but he uh, sees uh, he examines only the channel channel patients in the ward other other patients he doesn't look at them only the channel patients are seen so this is the other other side of the spectrum so so you uh, as a doctor you know what people expect from you therefore uh, don't take uh, all the seniors as examples you follow your conscience as a doctor so if you do good the good will come back to you so if you do good to others definitely the good will come back to you you reap what you sow if you sow honesty you will reap trust if you sow good things you will reap good friends if you sow humanity you can reap greatness who are the greatest people in the world if you can name them mahatma gand teresa mahatmi then uh, so many other people nelson mandela and all that all of them had one thing in common that is humanity not wealth or anything like that so if you want to be a great person not in the hospital at home please cultivate these things in your minds and heads and hearts the uh, talk nicely first to your to your spouse to your children of course for children you have to be rude sometimes but still if you keep the uh, human qualities in your in your heart you will be a great person wherever whether you are a doctor or not so especially for doctor they have to have human qualities empathy kindness and all that i don't know whether you have been taught in the medical schools that is a must for doctors and even for a, to be a great person if you show effort you can reap success if you give forgiveness you can reap peace 
So the other side of it. <coughs> sorry. If you saw hatred, you can reap disease. So you know, if you keep hatred and all negative things in your life as a doctor, you know the all the adrenaline and bad hormones will be there in your blood that will bring you diseases. If you sow envy, you can reap poverty. If you sow criticism, you can reap marginalization. If you sow meanness, you can reap sorrow. If you sow eminence, you can reap loneliness. So be mindful what you reap. One day you will have to sow it. This all is, is, is again said in different words. Uh, what goes around comes around. You would have heard that. So do good to others, the good will come to you. I can give you enough examples from the hospital sector itself. I don't think enough, uh, there's uh, enough time. Those, uh, uh, I will give you one example only. There, is, there was one uh, consultant in one of the hospitals where I was the director. He was going behind money. And uh, once he was given a, a scholarship, uh, for the whole family to be spent one week in a European country by a dark company. And he <clears throat> went, all tickets and everything was sponsored by this particular uh, this thing. And he used to prescribe this particular drug to all the patients. We don't know whether it's necessary or not. And there are so many other stories about this uh, consultant. And uh, he went abroad and came back and this particular uh, drug company uh, hired the vehicle, a van for him to come back to home. On the way, he met with an accident and uh, in fact, uh, close to our hospital, we sent an ambulance and we were the, the anesthetic team uh, to save his life. He was immediately transferred to the, uh, the national hospital, uh, but could not uh, fully recover, he was in a, in a coma state for eight years and died. So this is only one thing. And uh, other thing from the same hospital, there was a, there was a, uh, 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 we called, uh, nowadays they don't call mining staff, they call it uh, attendant, one, one male attendant who was very nice to patients, very kind to patients. Uh, the, the, sometimes he used to give his uh, lunch packet to the patients and uh, he going out of the way and uh, used to uh, do a lot of things for patients. And uh, he was so good when, while I was uh, in uh, his, his hospitals, he had one daughter and one, one, uh, one uh, son and a daughter, both uh, set for the uh, advanced level exam. The son was selected for the, uh, the engineering stream uh, in uh, Moratova and uh, the daughter was selected for medicine. So. You, you, I don't know what, what religion you are believing in, but uh, remember, whatever the religion, you, good, you do good to others, the good will come to you. That's common to, uh, common to any religion. So uh, as a doctor, maybe that you, are, uh, you, are, uh, you came to the uh, profession because you loved uh, uh, treating patients or sometimes maybe you, you want to earn, earn a lot. So, and, and have a happy life. So happiness in life depends on what? Wealth, land and properties, big house or new vehicle or what? No, it, it, it depends on well health, <coughs> sorry. Health and happiness and harmony in your family life. Remember this. Just suppose if you don't have a health, you are there are a lot of diseases. What's the what the use of your wealth or land or any property or big vehicle? If you are in trouble, you always some problem in the, in the family and and then a horrible family life. What is the purpose of your wealth, lands, property, a Mercedes or something? No, 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 no value in it if you don't have health. That is that is what is called health is wealth. So therefore, uh, hope if you want health, how do you, good, how you get health? You give health to others. That's the universal law. If you want something in life, you give it to others. If you want your children to be educated, you give the education to the, help the, the children who, who are in need for education. 
So that's uni universal universal uh, uh, truth, whatever your religion is. So see whether this 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 is uh, this law is in action in in hospitals. You will see. I, I can give you enough examples. So if you give you have you are in the best place to give health to others, and you give health to others the way they expect, you will be healthy for life, and you will have healthy children and they will go to whatever the place you wish them go and just see in your in your ward in your hospitals i have seen enough whether you are a doctor or a consultant if they do a good job what where are they in their family life and where where are they where, the, where their children are so uh, that is uh, that is a bit of uh, universal uh, rules and uh, money, of course, can make your life uh, life uh, comfortable uh, and contented. But money can can never make you happy. So you might you I don't know whether you you heard this Steve Jobs, the Apple guy, who said he he, he died of a pancreatic cancer, and before his death he said, "I can buy the best or the largest hospital in this world." but I cannot uh, bring uh, health to my life. I have such money. I had so many wealthy friends, but now I am in the deathbed, only my wife and children around me. But I, I suffer now because I did not treat them enough when I was well. So that was his words you would have heard. Even Bill Gates said, when he, when he got one million dollars he had a certain status of life even now he has more than 100 billion but still not 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 improved his life because of this money so he still maintains the status of life when he, he had one million dollars because you can't eat dollars you can't eat eat uh, gold so that's there you can have a comfortable life and you have, can have a com contented life with money, but you can't you can't be happy with life if you if you have to cry. So you will have to cry. Only difference is whether you are crying inside the Maruti or a Mercedes. So give give whatever you can to others. You will receive your quota. Remember, you have come to the perfect place to do it that's the hospital to give the best to the patient uh, once uh, there was this uh, uh, health minister minister fauci although he's not a buddhist he said if you want merit in life you have come to the best place he said in singular uh, you do your job, you earn something, and and you earn some merit also and good karma. So this was uttered by a, a Muslim uh, uh, health minister. So uh, keep these things in mind and uh, remember. Lastly, I should tell you that do you look after the ones under you under your care, maybe your wife or your children or your patients. You look after them and there is somebody up there to look after you. So you will see this universal law in action if you look carefully around in your hospital or society or anywhere. So with that, I, I wish you all the best for your future career. So according to my time, in there is a few minutes left. You can ask questions if you like, or come to the chat box. So uh, chat box, there is nothing. Are there any verbal questions? Right, uh, oh, thank uh -huh. you very much. Sir. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please use the chat box. At the meantime, we are going to the next. We are going to the next lecture by Dr. Madhavi Gunathilaka, consultant community physician at the uh, Director of Quality and Safety on guideline of for prepare 
maintenance of BHT. Right. Over to you, Dr. Man. proper maintenance of the bed head tickets for all the hospitals. So uh, this has all the information and this is available in our website. So you can see here, you can see our, the website. So I would recommend you to read uh, this guideline um, before uh, you go, before you start your internship. So this, this has very important uh, information. So why we need, so what is the importance of a VHT? So what do you think about this VHT? So you must be aware about, you must, you must be aware of this VHT because this has very important information, especially the personal information with regard to the patients and admission data and their clinical presentation and about the history and clinical findings. clinical findings and uh, they have uh, has the information about, uh, on uh, diagnosis and treatment and then this the PhD, PhD is very important to carry out scientific research. So that as a resource for all these, the reviews, retrospective reviews uh, for audits and research. And the most important thing is it is need document which can be challenged with a lot of work. So uh, it is really important to carry out proper maintenance, proper documentation in a VHT. So you can see uh, a recently introduced admission of sheet or the first page of a VHT, where you can see I have a, a highlighted in red with regard to the blood group and final diagnosis, comorbidities and cause of death. You show this admission, uh, the sheet, most of the contents are filled by the admitting officer or person who is uh, uh, doing the registration at the OPD and uh, the, the blood group and final diagnosis this information should be uh, filled in the world setting. So it's very important to carry out uh, the field all the relevant cases clearly, which is readable to everybody and accurately. And it is important to uh, mention the allergy status of the patient in red. So I think you are familiar with this because you have seen a lot of VHDs during your other, as a medical student. Uh, and even the blood group in red mention. So always clearly write the principal diagnosis if it is available for a patient. So there are continuation sheets for all the BHTs because um, patient may be like uh, in mode several days. So uh, it is important to uh, number all these uh, all the other sheets in the VHD in a chronological order, especially at the top right hand corner of the page. So uh, you can't remove any of the pages, so all the pages have to be intact. And if there are investigation forms, maybe like some folders, uh, it is important to number them in a chronological order. 
Also, in every page, it is important to write the name of the patient, surname with initials, and also the ward number and the PhD number of the top of each page. So, uh, it has an ID identification for the patient. And also, uh, as you all know that this VHT is uh, like uh, several subcategories enter their entries in this VHT. So, uh, for example, for records of nursing officers, it is important to category, uh, maintain separate categories, public subsection of this uh, the VHTs. And the most thing, important thing, the other most important thing is when you make an entry each time, it is important to make an entry, especially when a patient is seen by a healthcare professional, maybe a house officer, maybe a registrar, maybe a consultant. So it is important to make an entry and also make all the entries without undue delay, without any delay. And also uh, make entries in a chronological order because uh, we have seen some after, maybe after an incident or maybe after a death, we have seen some, uh, the, some medical officers, maybe some healthcare staff, they must have made some uh, retrospective entries to the VHTs. So that is not recommended. So make sure uh, to enter all the, the entries without undue delay. And also when a person making an entry, maybe a house office, maybe a medical officer, it is important to write his or her name with a designation. And also, place the signature at the end of the entry. So that is, if you are the, the person who is making the entry, but there are some instances. Uh, if a consultant, if a patient is seen by a consultant, uh, the entry is made by another person, maybe, for example, by a house officer. So still, you need to in, in, uh, include uh, the, per, the person or the most senior healthcare professional's name on the designation See, And also very important to mention the time. Because we have seen, uh, again, we have seen some, uh, in some, when there is some incident, this, the, the, the time is recorded from, for example, uh, we have, uh, uh, incorrectly uh, included uh, AM instead of PM. So you have to be really careful. And it is important to mention all the information, record all the information uh, with regard to the, like if you communicate with, the, with your consultant, maybe the registrar may be done call the CHO. If there are such communication, so it is important to do, uh, make entries with regard to the decisions made. Even if it is uh, the, if the communication is via the telephone, it is important to include the entries in the So uh, for example, if the instruction is given over the phone, the junior, the junior doctor should uh, write the observation and instruction. And also, it's important to read or repeat that this instruction within the PhD to the relevant person giving the instruction so that the message or the communication is confirmed. It as correct. And also, better not to leave like unused spaces or blank pages in between because uh, if there is such Thanks for spaces to blank pages. It is better like uh, cut it off with a single line. And also try to always use a black or blue pen to make your entries 
but for special like situations like for allergies, blood groups, and IV, right? So if there's a special concerns, there's special information you can use the red color thing. And also the clarity of the and clarity and the legitimacy of the entries. And see this is part of my PhD. Sometimes some of the, uh, the information may not be clear to everybody, so it is important, right? Uh, this uh, the information may be history because it gets tracked uh, in a clear uh, handwriting. Sometimes you may not have very uh, uh, very standard, very good handwriting, but take your time and write it clearly because it is really important. So even uh, I think if the previous lecture was mentioned by Professor and also it is important to name and label all the diagrams which you have given in the show you that how it should be that it should be uh, labeled. Um, properly because uh, that will uh, reduce the miscommunications and also it is better to avoid uh, using error abbreviations such as PNS. Some, some, still some, uh, we have seen in some of the some are written as PNS for patient not seen, but there is no such uh, the standard abbreviation for that. And even for during these, uh, the diagnosis writing, sometimes we use PF for viral fever. Still, it can be with regular information, so those things are not standard abbreviations. And for the for dengue fever and PCM, this is the very common uh, 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 the error prone abbreviation. Even uh, it was mentioned in the, the morning lecture. Uh, so this it's better to avoid all these error prone abbreviations, so that uh, the most of the the mishappening can be uh, prevented. And always document the actions taken for identified problems and also the care plan as comprehensive as possible. So it is also important to, uh, to include, mention the concerns taken for treatment procedures. I hope that you must be uh, aware of this the informed uh, consent form uh, developed uh, and issued by the Ministry of Health. It, it is available in our website and it is also being practiced in all in most of the hospitals. So try to use that uh, the, the, the informed consent form, uh, consent form which has each number. And also please try to include or uh, write all the relevant history and examination finding to DHD. Maybe more. Maybe you need to include both normal and abnormal findings, and also about these injuries and alcohol status, especially for these the road traffic accidents, uh, and even uh, for these assaults. So, if there are injuries, if a patient person, patient presents with uh, with injuries, it's important to write or uh, draw the diagram and uh, label and mark the injury, injur injuries in the body and also to mention about the alcohol status. So as they may, they are going to be the big colleague cases. So this reporting, this recording is really important. And uh, also this writing the differential diagnostics, try to uh, give the differential diagnosis whenever possible. And also decisions made and the actions agreed upon. And uh, and there may be some instances where uh, the we need to write the information given to the patients. If, for example, if it's surgery, or if it is maybe a procedure, so it is important to like uh, include the information given to the patients, and uh, you if you dis if you uh, discuss. Some treatment options, and you have explained risk for uh, risk 
uh, during this procedure. So if those information is available, it is important information in the BHD that you have to explain to that person, explain to that patient or maybe to a family member so that it will be uh, informative to everybody as well as if there's a legal issue, if there's any uh, problem. So uh, that is going to be helpful for you. And also, uh, if sometimes there may be patients' concerns and preferences and express wishes. So this is also important to mention in the PhD. Maybe, for example, um, some, some patients have concerns not to resuscitate. And if there are special concerns, it's important to mention. And sometimes uh, some, people, some patients refuse blood transfusions. Most things is important to uh, make a note on the, the BHD. And also, the reference mail and the investigations and drugs and treatment prescribes and also the advice given. So uh, I think this is going to be helpful even if you uh, if you are not going to practice in Sri Lanka, even if you go to Western countries, uh, this is really important to uh, the documentation part is really important. Even in the, the morning lectures, uh, the course mentioned that use these generic names at every possible instance. For example, this is the common, uh, one of the common uh, situations uh, where disorder calcium or calcium, sometimes the, the, in the practice, uh, they might write this panel all. So it's better to write all this, better to use these generic names at every possible instances. And also, if a patient is transferred within the hospital, maybe to another unit, maybe to another ward, so it is important to write the name of the consultant and the date and the time of the transfer. And if you have uh, recorded, if you have mentioned, uh, or if you, you need to change any information which I've already recorded, maybe you need to delete or you need to change it. So it's better to cut it from using a one, uh, one line. So yeah, what you have written previously is visible to everyone. And also you can uh, write the, the new option maybe, or the new, uh, whatever the, the suggestion or maybe recommendation. And also, you need to include your name and the signature and the date and the time because that has to be this information has to be there. And please do not permanently erase or don't keep exit, don't use this white uh, collection print or scribbling out or writing of the original so that everybody can see it. So you should not move this BHD. Should be there. So you should not remove any BHT, any sheets of the BHT. And there may be some, like uh, instances, there may be some uh, patients that sometimes patients may have to, may have given the uh, the wrong name, like there may be the changes in the, the initials, maybe in the names. So if there is if there is a correction need to be done in the BHD, which they have given during the admission, it is important to obtain a letter from the patient or the guardian requesting the change along with the proof of identity. Without this information, it's usually not uh, change the name of the other entities. If you have this they have, if you have this data from the patient guardian, then you can change uh, in the, you need to change uh, the name in all the relevant documents. And um, so uh, I hope I'll, uh, all the staff placing entries 
in the BHT are responsible for their campaign, for the campaign, and accuracy and entry. So we will do the entries in the BHT and because we are uh, responsible for this and um, if if the if uh, if some if, uh, if a person if uh, like for example house officers by an authorized staff for example the center is or he or she is uh, overall responsible for things written by the, the staff under the supervision but for this keep in mind that uh, when you do the uh, document always try to follow this guideline um, after implementing this uh, guideline actually one of the hospitals one of the quality and metabolism done an audit and in that audit they have done our um, they have the investigated 38 BHTs and they were audited especially for maintaining this in the front page, the stamp was assisting for capital. And the legibility and documentation of allergy was actually from the backs of optimal. And the maintaining the continuation sheets achieved was around 60% of the overall standard. And uh, they have a notice that specifically in the number in the pages and such problems because our so that we still we need a lot of improvement in uh, the number city and also uh, it's important for that all this morbidity and mortality data obtained from the PhD is the only source of information in the country for inflation data. So uh, for that, uh, the completeness of this, the completeness as well as the legibility of this, the, the record tickets are really important. So again, another hospital have done an audit uh, with regard to this, the, the, the writing of diagnosis according to TICD-10 classification. So uh, according to their audit, the 65% of PhDs did not have final diagnosis written for the TICD-10. So as how, so this is mostly yeah, that after the patient is discharged, if there is a proper diagnosis or there is a diagnosis, uh, you need to mention it in the front page. And only 10.6% of PhDs have final diagnosis written. And 38% of patients only have final diagnosis written. So I was over actually talking abbreviations mentioned full or the the diagnosis in full name and um, the entries were legible in 61 so uh, I hope uh, you will take this message and uh, do a proper like, documentation in the BHTs as you are going to start uh, your internship very soon. Um, so if you have any questions, uh, you may ask now. So I don't see any questions in the chat box. I wish you all the best for your internship. Your work to start very soon. Uh, and uh, good luck. Good luck.
with all your work and uh, thank you very much for listening. Um, in the chat box, I can see um, a question. Uh, could you please explain the of the documentation? Uh, very good uh, question. Thanks. Thank you very much for asking that question. Uh, still, you can attend to the emergency, and still, you can effectively uh, uh, do your record, record all your, uh, your documentation in your BHD, but uh, make sure that it has to be analogical. You need to include on your information what you have done uh, with the time and uh, the, with the relevant uh, the names of the patient of the responsible officers. Thank you very much for asking the question. And there's another question, uh, Madam, how to find a list of abbreviations that are appropriate to use. So it is local in the website it's available in the other uh, internet so it's try to always use uh, I would recommend you to use only the standard abbreviations very commonly used standard abbreviations because uh, when you use this abbreviation some of the, uh, the persons who is attending to your instruction uh, uh, the information may not be there with some of the abbreviations. So always try to use, uh, try to minimize the, the abbreviations, but if you are going to use other abbreviations, uh, use only the standard abbreviations because that won't minimize the errors and uh, ensure the patient's safety. Thank you very much uh, for listening. And as there are uh, no, any other comments or no, any other questions, I think we can go to the next uh, Dr. Shan. Someone asked, have asked a question, uh, can we wear scrubs? Uh, what do you mean by this scrubs? If you scrub to, uh, during the internship? I think yeah, it's better to like communicate with respective consultants in your uh, wards. And if they wish, uh, you can uh, do a uh, 
according to the, your consultant's wish. Yes, uh, I think I have given the answer. So it depends on your the consultant in your ward. So it's better to ask from the consultant. Open consultant. So in the ministry level, we have no any other. We have no restrictions. Our, uh, our next uh, session uh, is on uh, clinical indicator monitoring and health care quality and safety. Uh, the session will conduct by uh, Dr. Priyanta Lianagi. Uh, over to you, madam. Can you see the Yes, yes. I will start. Good afternoon, okay. everyone. Actually, I am going to talk about the clinical indicators. The clinical indicators are collected by our performance tree, quality performance evaluation tool. Actually, that I know that you all know there's a quality directorate of health care quality and safety, which is the focal point. We have a quality performance evaluation tool where we collect the data with regard to quality in quality and safety information. And also we uh, do the review portal. And you may wonder why it is important for you. You all are going to be posted in clinical specialties or clinical specialties. And it's important for you to know the indicators and the standards of the quality and safety. And also, why you should know these things is you will be a part of the work improvement team. You know, there will be quality units. About the hospital, there will be a quality unit, and there will be a quality demo, and there will be the staff. So they will be the focus point, focal point in the institution. And they will be collecting this data on quality performance evaluation too. 
and you are actually when in the unit there will be work implement teams and you will be a part of it so you should know about these indicators then secondly there are something called clinical audits where you see the, uh, you want to improve the clinical indicators so in, when you are conducting when hospital is conducting clinical audits you will be a stakeholder of it and also uh, that uh, it is good to know the quality improvement tools so you can um, improve your clinical your performance so that's why you should know these quality performance evaluation tools and indicators and standards. And actually, as a quality unit, we were, with, we were collecting this data for many years, for more than like 2018, 2017, and we had the PowerPoints, and quality MO uh, is responsible for sending the data to us, and we have been reviewing. And with the time, this tool has been uh, reviewed and improved. Now, uh, with the funding from the global fund, there was a, under the budget lines, we have we have been able to improve this further. This has been uh, drafted with the help of the experts from the colleges and other administrators and other relevant stakeholders. Actually, the indicators what we are monitoring here is not only the Aspects uh, we should look at quality and safety, but we have chosen some as very important aspects where we can monitor and evaluate the quality and safety. So uh, there are there are still there are like a uh, PowerPoint, but very in future near future this will be converted to software in the hospitals where they can enter the data online. So this will be included into that state as house officers. So you are very uh, fortunate to have uh, to learn about this. So it will be very helpful to you. So you will know what we collect the data. If when you are doing a clinical audit, you will be you know the standards and how to indicate those things. So uh, I mainly focus on the clinical uh, indicators, but uh, for your for the complete uh, completion and for you to know the way it falls, like you know you to know where the, this falls, I go through the performance review program, program, just a slide by slide for you to know. So this is the start of the day right the name of the institution for the end the year. So uh, they agree this uh, slide, there's a guide for you to uh, know how to fill that uh, form but when we are sending the guide is separately we are sending the institution. Also this format and the guide is in our website. So you can always go through that. So in the slide one we have given mentioned the year quarter and name of the institution in the relevant places. So there are, there are parts. This part one is the vision and mission of the institution. This is display on the side that you don't read it, just uh, you have to display it. Then this is about the hospital, about the hospital uh, staff of the staff and the head of the institution about the hospital staff. This is also display on the slide. Then uh, staff categories, it's very important whether you have uh, microbiologists and other things, quality and more those things. We are having the data. Yeah, they have been in the slide by us. Every slide we have given the guide. This is about the statistic of the hospital bed strength, total number of admissions, like average length of stay and losing the admission rate. So for you to get used to it and for you to know how to calculate, we have to find the denominator, numerator, and how to calculate. I want to tell you some of the data comes from PhDs, and registers, and some documentation. Some you may have to do surveys and find out. So in that also, you have to help the quality MO and other staff to get this data. So average number of admissions per day, total number of admission for the period, total numbers in patient days during the period. 
like that we have given here and then we will write it for you to know. So in there is a total column also, so we have to get the average. The total column is here, so we have to get the average. I know the admission statistics of the institution, but we decide. So, how to completely decide? This may or may not be good in details, but you can read it and find what you can easily understand. So, actually, we have given the uh, instruction how you are presenting the data to us, also, no need to read all the numbers. And into that extent, we have guided you how to present that. This is uh, we have concentration thing on the OPD statistics. Number of OPD patients for Q1, what are we, what is the end or like uh, average number for OPD patients in most like we have concentration thing on the OPD patients. So in this slide, in the guide, we have given you how to calculate. Then this is about waiting time. It's a very important indicator in the OPD. Waiting time for registration in patient comes and how much time it took to register for the consultation, for investigation. So we have given that indicator in our to find the data. Um, most of the IP system, so it is easy to calculate that and then you know, here you have to do a survey and find out. Now there's body class is it's very easy to find out. So for every uh, this indicator we have given definitions then. So we have said that in these slides also they are six. Right. They are arrived with two of when we have pointed out so you can easily calculate. This is about clinic performance. Medical and then we have another clinic so waiting time. Actually, with you all, a lot of the people team also feel highly difficult, and other stuff was highly difficult. So we have skip, we can select things for each part. So we have make it peaceful for you as much as possible. So about this is about surgical performance. Actually, in this also, I want to mention one thing is surgical completion of surgical safety checklist is a very important indicator. You must know it, this indicator. Because it is very important for the safety of the patient. So, whether you have to know how many checklists are attached to the major surgeries, how many are completed, it can be done by a surgeon. It is a very important indicator. It will be done by the end of the lecture about the surgical safety. Of number of vehicles and number of vehicles yes, to say in section was part of infection. Those things are collected. So we have to decide how to calculate. For example, serial section. These are total serial sections performed on a device with the Like this, it's a total 
be about the quality management treatment. The hospital, gently, the staff is quality we are getting the closer and they have this thing. Activities we are going to have and then starting the physical form as the quality action and the cross and the physical the important information. Then uh, about availability for the quality of care quality, whether you are having quality management, most of the hospital stand. So you are having quality steering information, it's very very important to change. One member of the information. So as of all, quality service now. So how many wards do you have in the hospital? This is very important to say. And how many have established the quality working day which consisting staff So how many is functioning functioning out of established like that? It's so very important. I am not going to read in an every everything in these slides. If you are interested, you have to you have to read another website. So this training was very important. We have the training topic and staff categories targeted, number of programs done, and completion in the content. So this is it makes very important other thing, suggestion of feedback. Do you have suggestion boxes and feedback boxes in your institutions? That, that you have, do you analyze the things that the suggestions and feedbacks you have? So we have a slide for that. And you have to explain the piece. Size and improvements. Yeah, you have done some coaching with you. Good ideas, innovative ideas, processing. You have to that. In about quality focus studies, as I told you, there are patient satisfaction and employee satisfaction survey. It's very good that if you was who can conduct this study. You have very lot very much and you have less time in the middle of the during that time also if you are innovative and you are good, you may also find time during this period. It's very important. Patient is the most important customer in this that if you want to improve you have their satisfaction and their how to improve and how satisfaction is also important. If you give them guidelines, how much you can give at least two patient satisfaction, one in those experiments. Clinical labs, as I told you, as professionals. Actually, very important for you for the improvement, professional improvement also. If we get uh, we get into the clinical audits, you have to remember the clinical audit team. Now you, as I told you, you know the indicative standards to see whether you have your hospital, your board has reached the standard can clinical. Personal, professional development and for the improvement of the clinical, clinical 
because that is for and must be very few I I few value. You can find time to uh smart you because you be a member of the clinical audit team and try to do it. There's a part five meetings reduce disaster the bear. Yes, hospital management are you safe to scale in bound yes? I can also be a part of my office. Reduce and get reviews and meeting. Yeah, we do. Get me. As, as uh, a time permit, you try to know about these things and when participate in these things. Disaster also has a disaster for the space. Disaster management skills. Those things are also there. Disaster response plan. Cleaning care. This is the part department level of hospital is not level one. Can be infection direction as officer. First things are there, you have to know about these things. Actually, hand hygiene control, hand hygiene audit is also being done. Part is also very important for you. So we have we have been there. Numerator. Chart. The rationale. How to collect the data. Everything can in the guide. Very comprehensive. Just you, I know you won't remember each and everything, but if you want to calculate, you can go back to the guide and see. It is a hand writing compliance rate. There's five moments you have to do those things. They do have like a observation, you will check the compliance. They report it at each unit. It's very important. Actually, this is something we can always improve. There are no need of a lot of uh, skills and infrastructure, but with training and attitudes, you can improve this. That circular also. Then you refer to these circulars when you are free. So, admission compliance for unit is total number of moves that are hit for form, total number of moves. Yeah. Yes, so, we have given the indicated information, rate, unit, target, rationale. This we are in have to consent clinical indicator. Slide number thirty three to forty two is related to clinical indicator. Clinical services and indicators related to services, HIV, TB, and malaria. This uh, last two indicator related to HIV, TB, data incorporate recently. So I told you that we reviewed this uh, format and we are going to make it a software with the fund, help of the global funds. So this uh, HIV, TB, and malaria is related to global funds. Well, we are funding for these things, so we actually just get in. Clinical indicators in medicine. 
plus one a one b plus one is that is percentage of patients with any criminality in less than 30 minutes of arrival in hospital in sterilization by cardiac infarction and general time. Percentage of patients undergoing primary percutaneous coronary intervention in less than 10, 90 minutes, less than 90 minutes in arrival to hospital in Stenmore. So actually, all the hospitals, most of the hospitals have that immunotic therapy, but some hospitals don't have this primary cutaneous coronary intervention. This indication definition is given. Total needle time is defined as the time between the moment of entrance of the patient to the hospital and coronary syndrome, diagnosis and sterilization, and body infarction and start receiving the therapy. So, fibrological to be given in the city. As the operational addiction, we have to have some practical thing. Admission to the hospital will be considered at the time of entry. So, how do you collect it? Memory is there, denominator is there. How do you collect the data? So, maintain the register in each unit. I told you most of the data can be obtained from the registers, VHDs, and other things. Name and uh, other details in this register. Name of the patient, VHD number, date of time of admission, time of taking ECT, and administration complete. So, as earlier told in the lecture, VHD maintains this very important. Collecting data also. So, I just told the indication definition in how to collect all that given in the drive. So, Value time was the same. Then, another clinical indicator percentage of patients with diabetes, but in clinics, when fasting blood sugar of 730 taken, there are the clinic patients, diabetes, and hypertension, and the uh, B1C. Most of the time, there are fasting blood sugar events. It's expensive. And uh, blood pressure control of the clinic patient. There we have given to indicate the definition, numerator, denominator, and target. So how to collect them, how to take them, sample, how to take how many people. I just give an example. If the clinic calculate the 20% of the number of samples as sample, there yeah, you get the clinic number of the patient. Clinic you can get in 20% of the number. If this number is less than 30, at least you have to do it in a so don't worry. You will worry how like you they say you will be put up in this day. So when you are doing a survey, you have to have doing sample. You can't do those things in most of the every person. So you have to calculate twenty percent of the sample. And uh, if it is less than thirty, you take thirty. So everything is given in this. The heart can put Percentage of asthma patients who have been followed up at his studio when patient department. Patient is asked for it is not controlled. 
control using the state. There are many indicators, five indicators. These are not the aspects that, uh, that should be created into the same part as a consultation spurts as uh, the monitoring and evaluation purpose. After structure of surgery rate of cancellation of GB surgery, waiting time to cancel. Cancellation should be defined as any operation that was scheduled to be released from the end of the career. The number of scheduled surgeries that were cancelled in Canada is very unique. Sourcing. So, in the theatre list, standard, we determine after six months. So, we have to see the rate. Actually, this is, there are cancellation can be due to many reasons. Maybe we can find out reasons. We see lack of theater time, lack of instruments, staff, patient being motivated. Of course, we are always collecting data for the purpose of improvement, purpose of the improvement. You are best for the patients. Find it by yeah. any other data was the main reason for us to collect the data and review for us to improve. So they waited time. I told you some more very important indicator is percentage of major surgery solution to surgical safety check. A very important thing. Something you can do. You can, uh, that it's implemented and they are many patients. So, you <coughs> see, the indicator side for the result of you and the rate of surgical site infection, rate of hospital staff index of patient related by the college of surgery. I'll just uh, as an important indicator, I can find the percentage of major surgery. Patient definition is major surgery using the surgical safety checklist is defined as There are all three columns are three. The total number of during the canon. So relation data must be used. Again, it's very important to write the PhD. Eliminated. The number of next surgeries So for your for your feasibility you can call it at least then you do a survey and find out how many so for that you can have a column and you have a column if it is failing or not. And the internal audits can carry out additional 
So it is easy when you are having a register and you have you know how to convert data because you can have your ways to collect data and you can have your part. The human find the text of data. Then uh, about I uh, talk about medical and in surgical then about period books and you need the file, first one means percentage of children with admitted by the one is children with dengue hemorrhage fever who died during the last three months. The third one is third one is that requires percentage of hospital babies affected to neonate with open. So you may wonder what are these, how to calibrate, but we are given this. So, actually, the sample size should be 30. Take a sample and then. But reading those, it may not fall into your head, but you must the performance review format and the guide. So there are three days uh, the percentage of neonates so less than 20 weeks after the readmitted to the hospital water with breastfeeding issues, poor weight gain, dehydration. Proceeds. The fifth one is percentage of babies in the neonate clinical for two months, eight months, and six years. And six six weeks are the seven. Sixth one is gestation system mobility rate of 30 two weeks of gestation. So those are the six indicators in the day. The consultation, pediatricians, and other experts. There are guides for the calculate. So sixth one I just read for you. Gestation is order rate 32 weeks. Number of babies born alive in the 32 weeks of gestation and subsequently died. Total number of babies born alive in the 32 weeks of gestation. So uh, these are the five indicators. Little indicators of observation. First is labor induction rate, hysterectomy rate, cesarean friction rate, or thickness of the friction rate, average waiting time for the validation. This fourth one means very important. The fifth one is information. So, at least we have to go out in the of part of it. It's very important as surgical safety safety. Yeah. Like of part of it. Data sources part of them attached to the PhDs. So we need to stop the number of the number of the right. Data sources from the So we have to have 100 percent from can. We will have we have one minus so that we need have 100 percent. This is very important. 
and then they will lose. They will do it in time for the food and use the fire. The power of the system will be probably getting seven days. There are five recently put. So you can see that our percentage of our capital of the paper, we have to check this test. The checklist for that to see the work because the number of priorities there are five. So in, in, they have given in degree three to five to be completed only by hospital and not the relevant specialists. So there are indicators in I recently added those the indicators in HIV and HIV and malaria. Three for HIV, two for TB, and yes, no. actually two or three for malaria. Consider so one is a percentage initiation of ARD within two weeks of registration in patient diagnosis with HIV. Malaria percentage of patients take for malaria or for malaria. There are indicators we have incorporated for this course. Please go through this performance report and guide for you to know. We have given in details again and again I'm telling that how to calculate this indicator. So that's all about his uh, clinical indicators and the things we incorporated into the performance review for performance for us to review for improvement. So there are the general indicators as we collect uh, the Excel sheet of the general That's all about the indicators. You may find how uh, we did a lot of how can we uh, concentrate, but actually, this is day to day you practice so that is connected with your day to day practices. Just go through this and remember that we are collecting this data. This data is important for us to improve the service and to the patients. So please try to uh, give your fullest cooperation to quality management and uh, be a part of a good circle. And you need to find time for clinical audit. So if you want to know the standards, you put in both of them, this. Uh, Guideline and find the standards for the clinical indicators. This all this uh, performance review format and guide is in our website. You know the website now www.k that you have you can go to that website and find this another documents also in our website. So uh, try when you are going to specialties, focus specialties, please try to remember these things also. And uh, to end up the presentation, I want to congratulate you and wish you good luck with your future career. Thank you very much for listening. Right. Uh, thank you very much. That was uh, Dr. Priyanta Lienagi, consultant, community physician on clinical indicators monitoring on the healthcare quality and safety. Right. Uh, we'll have a question. Use the chat box to ask, madam. So, next up is uh, reporting of incidents by Dr. Nimali Vijayagunu Odana, consultant, community physician, and director of uh, quality and safety. Thank you. 
Over to you, Dr. Nam. Uh, can you see the presentations? Yes, we can see. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so uh, today, uh, the session I'm going to uh, conduct is on incident reporting. Uh, so uh, let me just uh, give you an overview of what we are going to talk about during this session. So we are going to discuss what adverse events or incidents are and uh, why <laughs> Report incident. And also, uh, we are going to discuss about the initiatives taken by the Ministry of Health and the Directorate of Health Care Quality and Safety uh, to facilitate this uh, incident reporting, uh, which will be very useful for the um, intern medical officers in we will be uh, working towards uh, uh, as a, like a first line care, and you will be uh, coming across certain incidents uh, which. Uh, uh, would be, uh, it, uh, we will discuss why it is good to report these incidents uh, for learning purposes and uh, to make sure that uh, certain incidents don't happen again uh, and we can learn from the uh, experience. Uh, so, uh, first of all, we will uh, look at a few definitions. Um, so, an uh, incident or an adverse incident is uh, any deviation from uh, what we consider as usual medical care. Uh, which can cause an injury or a harm to the patient or uh, even pose a risk of harm to the patient. So this could include errors as well as uh, adverse events and also hazards. So we'll see what an error is. So uh, as you can uh, see here, uh, errors can uh, be either errors of execution or errors of planning. Like errors of execution is where you plan correctly, but uh, the planned action uh, cannot be completed as intended. There is some failure in the process. For example, you plan uh, to give the patient uh, some medication to cure or, 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 uh, or resolve his uh, ailment, but uh, you end up giving the person a wrong dose of the drug. Pain something like that. And uh, the other thing is error of planning where the plan itself is wrong to achieve the aim which you want to uh, achieve. Like uh, if you want to give uh, a patient of some uh, pain, you're giving a, a, a wrong drug or you're uh, using the wrong uh, method of treatment, something like that, so the plan is wrong. So uh, both of these uh, errors could occur. And also, there could be errors of commission and errors of omission. Like errors of commission uh, is where you uh, you uh, commit some error, such as like you give the person a wrong dose of the drug. Error of omission is like you commit the error by omitting the, uh, the omitting the action which you need to do. Like uh, if you don't uh, if, uh, provide the patient with the uh, medicine or the treatment that the patient uh, deserves or patient uh, is supposed to be given, 
then that is the era of formation. So both these have an uh, effect on the patient and also they uh, usually, uh, all these could re uh, reflect some deficiencies in the system of care. And then um, adverse event. So adverse events are uh, the uh, any injuries or harm which can be related to the medical management. These are not complications of the normal course of the disease of the patient. This could be due to many aspects of care, including the diagnosis and, and maybe the failure to diagnose without treat. And then there could be uh, defects in the system, uh, defects in the equipment, and so on. And uh, then uh, they, some of these adverse events are preventable, whereas uh, some adverse events are some, uh, non preventable. For example, now uh, if we take uh, medication related uh, in, uh, adverse events, um, if the patient uh, gets an uh, allergy following a, following a drug, or if the patient gets a reaction following a blood uh, transfusion, then uh, probably most of them are not are non preventable unless the patient has had a previous history of allergy. Uh, but if you give the patient a wrong dose of the drug, or if you give the patient the wrong drug, or give the drug to a wrong patient, then that sort of things are definitely preventable. So, like that, there could be a preventable and non preventable adversity. And then hazards are any threat to the safety, including. Uh, Practices conduct equipment uh, which are unsafe to the um, patient and uh, pose a threat to the safety. Then uh, you must have heard this word also the sentinel event. Sentinel events are like uh, very serious patient safety events which can result uh, in death uh, or even if death doesn't occur, uh, there could be permanent harm to the patient. Or even it's, if it's uh, temporary, it could be very severe harm. So that sort of events uh, are called sentinel events and those need uh, very, uh, we need to focus very much on those things uh, so as to prevent them. And then uh, near miss, I think uh, this also you must have heard. Uh, so these are incidents which uh, which were about to happen but uh, did not happen in the end because uh, by some reason um, it was obstructed. The happening of this uh, incident was uh, uh, avoided or obstructed due to some, uh, some factor. For example, if we take now the patient uh, is, um, uh, let's say the patient was prescribed some medicine and then it was uh, transcribed wrong at the ward and then the patient was about to be uh, given that medication but uh, the patient uh, says that uh, this is not the usual medicine that I take so then uh, they check back and identify that there had been a mistake or an error so something like that which was uh, avoided uh, at some point I think you remember in the in a previous lecture by Pascal Apathy she mentioned about this uh, this cheese model also. So like that, at even at some point, at some step, if, if, if it was uh, avoided, such an incident we call a near miss. So uh, also called a potential adverse event. So you know, definitely these things also need to be reviewed and analyzed uh, because at a, uh, other, another uh, incident could uh, lead to an adverse event. So, uh, Every year, uh, there are large numbers of patients who are actually harmed or sometimes even die because of unsafe healthcare. This is not uh, uh, specific to Sri Lanka or, or middle-income countries. This is common for uh, all countries in the global context. So, uh, due to these uh, yeah, errors or due to these uh, incidents, uh, there is a high burden of death as well as disability worldwide, but it is specially there in the low and middle income countries. So um, even in high income countries, uh, it has been estimated <laughs> that uh, one in 10 patients is subject to an adverse event while receiving hospital care. So that is a 
significant uh, number of adverse events and uh, in uh, low and middle income countries uh, that uh, the burden is even more. So this is, uh, here you can see uh, how much of adverse events are occurring. So it says 134 million adverse events uh, occur due to unsafe care uh, in hospitals in low and middle income countries and a large number of deaths also occur, like 2.6 million deaths every year. So you can see the gravity of uh, incidents and uh, adverse events occurring in uh, the healthcare settings. But we have to realize that these adverse events usually do not occur unless the broth negligence do not occur because some bad person is intentionally hurting the patient or treating the patient badly. It's because uh, nowadays uh, the healthcare system is so complex that not only your competence as an individual healthcare provider is adequate to have a good outcome, a successful outcome. There's a lot of uh, factors, a uh, uh, range of factors which uh, decide on the final successful treatment and outcome. That is why adverse events do occur in, in every healthcare setting. And uh, what we need to do is try to uh, minimize them, try to uh, avoid uh, have, uh, the occurrence of an adverse event for the second time. So that is why uh, the, uh, the reporting of adverse events uh, is very useful. We will talk about it uh, in the slides. So uh, here's a scenario. Uh, let's just read it out. Uh, when dispensing the medicine at the outpatient department, a patient was given the wrong medication. There was a staff shortage at the pharmacy that day, resulting in a long queue of patients waiting for their medicine. The drug that was pres uh, dis uh, dispensed was similar in appearance to the drug that was actually prescribed. The drug containers at the pharmacy were not properly arranged or labeled. This is the scenario where a patient has been given a wrong medication. So there has been a staff shortage at the pharmacy that day and a long queue of patients have been waiting for their medicine. And uh, the, the, uh, the dispenser or the pharmacist has given, uh, uh, the, given the drug, uh, which was uh, given a wrong drug, which was similar in appearance to what has been uh, prescribed. And uh, the, the, the pharmacy setting, the drug containers are not properly arranged or labeled. So uh, considering this scenario, um, what do you think are the possible contributing factors for this medication error? So we can see that the error has been uh, committed, uh, the wrong medication is given. So uh, what sort of contributing factors could be there for this uh, scenario or the, this situation? You can, um, you can think of some of the factors can put in the chat box uh, and we can discuss. I will give you about uh, one minute. You can uh, give some of the contributory factors and then we can uh, discuss uh, what sort of factors would be contributing to this sort of error. Any comments? We have, uh, we have some uh, comments, staff shortage, causing workers to migrate. Any other comments? Okay, we can uh, yeah, 
negligence, important arrangements, similar appearance of drugs. Yeah. Okay, thank you for the comments. So, uh, let's uh, discuss some of them. Yeah. So, staff shortage, you also have identified that true. So, uh, shortage of staff in the uh, particular hospital uh, has indefinite, uh, like uh, it uh, must have led to uh, work overload. So, uh, the there is uh, more of a chance of errors occurring when there's a large queue of patients uh, waiting for their medicine uh, and there's, there's not enough staff and they are, uh, they are working uh, and uh, they, they, there's a load of work for them, uh, the errors can occur. And they, uh, yes, and then the unavailability of an appointment system. Now the patients, uh, like uh, the patients, uh, if, they were, if there was an appointment system where the patient could, uh, be uh, like uh, given an appointment and then there won't be an, uh, such a queue, then this could have been uh, sometimes avoided. Then inadequate attention paid to dispensing look-alike, sound-alike drugs. I think this was discussed in the morning also by Sitala uh, So you have also mentioned the similar appearance. Yes, so the, now the, the, the drug which was prescribed was uh, similar uh, in appearance to the drug that was dispensed. So if they had paid some attention to the um, this factor, then uh, the error could have been prevented. So, and there are uh, poor awareness about this look-alike, sound-alike drugs. And then the improper storage or labeling of drugs at the pharmacy. So um, there was no proper labeling of the drugs. Uh, if you read that uh, circular or the uh, on prescribing medicine, uh, which was uh, discussed in the morning, it mentions about the tall man labeling, labeling of the like sample like drugs. So if something like that would have done, uh, then this would not have happened. Then uh, this sort of uh, management and uh, supervision issues, like uh, deficiencies in rostering, staff management, so that sort of things also could have indirectly affected this situation. So when you look at these things, you can uh, see that uh, like uh, most of the time, uh, the, there are uh, system defects or system errors, uh, system failures, which are going to affect these uh, errors. So it is. it has been actually found out that uh, out of the uh, all the errors or the, all the incidents, which are happening about 85% of the time, it is some these things are happening due to system failures. Individual failures or individual uh, failure of an individual person uh, leads to these things uh, uh, about 15% of the time. So, what we need to understand is that these things are actually uh, mostly happening due to uh, system uh, failures. So, that is why we need to. Identify the, the, these things so that we can make some uh, when we can have amendments or changes so that similar things would not happen again. So before we move on to the uh, incident uh, reporting, uh, a few things to discuss about types of incidents occurring in the healthcare setting. So as we uh, discussed earlier, also medication errors are one leading cause, and uh, most of the time uh, we can avoid. Uh, incidents uh, related to medication um, process. And uh, then there can sometimes be unsafe surgical care procedures. Then uh, sometimes healthcare associated infections occur due to improper uh, infection prevention and control procedures. Then uh, there can be unsafe injection practices, transcription practices. Then sometimes diagnostic errors occur, uh, radiation related errors and harm occur. And there could be sepsis. This is uh, not the uh, complete list of incidents uh, in the healthcare settings, but these are some of the common things which are happening in the healthcare settings. So, uh, what is the impact? Like uh, when we think about the impact, uh, we uh, first of all we think about the health impacts. 
like uh, there could be many complications for the patient due to this uh, error or the incident. Uh, then uh, the patient could suffer infections. Then uh, sometimes even death occurs. The patient has to uh, stay for a, a longer, a longer time in the hospital due to these complications occurring due to this error. So things like that can happen as health impacts. But on top of that, there are many economic impacts as well. Like uh, for treatment of these uh, incidents, uh, treatment related to the incident, uh, there are, they are definitely is going to be additional costs. Then for the patients also, the out-of-pocket expenditure for them increases. They lose their income for uh, um, additional number of days. So those things can happen. So this is the amount of uh, economic impact or the gravity of economic impact uh, related to errors. This is only for medication errors globally. It is estimated that uh, the cost is approximately uh, 42 billion US dollars. So that is the amount of um, errors, uh, the economic impact, medication errors only. So for all errors and all um, incidents, this would uh, it is much higher than that. So these are some of the factors or situations uh, which associate with an increased risk of errors. Like some of these things can increase the risk of uh, errors or in, uh, incidents occurring. For example, uh, inexperience of staff and them uh, being uh, not familiar with the settings or the procedures. And then uh, increased workload is one of the main issues. Uh, and a shortage of time. Shortage of time is usually uh, due to increased workload. You cannot pay attention uh, to a particular patients for a long time because there's a lot of work. And then there could be some work procedures leading to error and uh, inadequate checking, like uh, what we discussed, what was discussed in the morning. Uh, inadequate checking, inadequate information for the staff. Um, and uh, you know, providing of inadequate information for patients, both, uh, and then lack of knowledge and skills that can also lead to uh, increased risk of errors. This can be lack of knowledge of skills of the uh, healthcare workers, as well as lack of knowledge and awareness in the patient. And then there could be some individual factors as well, like uh, uh, limited mental capacity, fatigue, stress, and then illness maybe, then language barriers, things like that can also uh, have an impact on the uh, increased risk of CDAT socket. So with all that, uh, the, as the Directorate of Healthcare Quality and Safety, we are the uh, uh, national focal point for uh, the quality uh, and uh, safety uh, program for the country. So a uh, uh, national policy on healthcare quality and safety was developed uh, by the directorate. Uh, I think this was mentioned in the morning, first lecture by our director, uh, Dr. David Kandila. So this uh, uh, national policy, as uh, it was mentioned, that uh, there are seven key results areas. So out of this key results area, the fourth one is risk management and safety. And uh, what uh, is expected is to mitigate risk from medications, procedures, and adverse events to ensure safety of patients as well as staff. So I'm showing this uh, so that you uh, get an idea that at the national level, at the policy level, um, this uh, incident reporting and incident identification uh, and things are being focused and uh, are being uh, considered with very much importance. So uh, we have a national strategic plan for healthcare quality and safety for 2021-25. And under this fourth key uh, result area of risk management and safety, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, reporting of adverse events has been mentioned. And here you can see the action plan. Uh, here the uh, strengthening an effective reporting system for adverse events and so under that, the interventions identified is to strengthen the adverse event reporting system to uh, provide uh, standard definitions, classifications, and uh, formats for reporting, and uh, a mechanism, uh, a user-friendly mechanism for reporting, and to 
facilitate learning from adverse events at organization. So that is very important. Uh, just reporting will not have any impact, will not have any purpose unless you um, analyze them and learn from those adverse events. Uh, so uh, this is uh, in the action plan of the uh, strategic plan uh, that I mentioned. All these documents are available in our um, directorate website. You can go if, they are, if you are interested. So, um, so let's move on to why uh, reporting incidents is important. So uh, first of all, we have to, uh, like, I would like to emphasize that uh, this uh, reporting mechanism that which, uh, we are going to discuss and which has been implemented in the hospitals uh, is not to find fault with any person. So we, we emphasize on that, uh, that uh, we reporting these incidents is to learn from the incident so that the necessary remedial action can be taken uh, and uh, we, we can ensure that similar incident will not occur in the future. That is our motive. So that a second incident will not occur, a similar incident will not occur. So that is uh, why we encourage uh, uh, reporting and uh, with the intention of avoiding harm to patients operating due to errors operating in the healthcare settings. So that is our final uh, outcome uh, the, to avoid harm for the patients. So, uh, in order to uh, reduce the number of errors occurring in the uh, healthcare settings, we need to identify them, identify the uh, root causes, and uh, do the necessary preventive action. So that is the uh, uh, motive of the incident reporting system which we are uh, we have uh, established. So. Uh, about this no blame culture. No blame culture is where the, the reporting is not concerning about the individual who was involved in the incident. We are not trying to identify who did this, which category of staff, uh, what is the name, uh, which ward, not that. We are not concerned about whether the individual, uh, about uh, um, uh, punishing the patient, blaming the patient, cornering the patient, not that. The purpose is to identify the discrepancy in the system because we discussed most of the things are happening due to some system error. If we consider the root causes, then we need to get to identify that, um, except for a few uh, maybe uh, gross negligence uh, that will be different. But other than that, most of the things are happening due to some system error. So the, the intention is to identify these uh, discrepancies in the system and to rectify them. So uh, this uh, no blame culture is going to encourage and motivate the people to report the incidents occurring in their hospitals without being concerned that they are going to be judged or blamed or punished because they report them. So this will facilitate the uh, talking about this incident openly and uh, without concealing any facts then we will be able to correctly uh, identify the main factors, contributory factors, and it will help in uh, taking the remedial action to prevent future incidents. So uh, how can this uh, no blame culture be created? The heads, the consultants, the other unit heads all have a major role to play, but all staff uh, in general have a role to play in this. So uh, like uh, always the, uh, incident reporting uh, process needs to be facilitated, encouraged. Like those who report uh, incidents should be encouraged and supported rather than blamed and cornered. Like if people feel that when you are reporting an incident, you, uh, you will be blamed by the others for reporting that, then the, if that sort of a culture is there in a hospital, reporting will not occur. So what we need to uh, do is like create a culture in the hospital, in the ward, in the unit. So uh, that uh, reporting of incidents is encouraged rather than blamed. So, uh, and also we, are, we see in some hospitals, the reporters are appraised. Uh, they uh, discuss these things and uh, give uh, uh, feedback 
so the things like that encourage the reporters and also adequate awareness and reassurance that uh, they will not have any punitive action related to reporting of the incident and uh, the adequate resources. Now, resources, we will talk about the uh, formats that are available for reporting the incidents and also the correct process, the guides for uh, how to report. Uh, and uh, then also the analyzing of the incident, which is uh, usually done by the uh, quality management unit in the hospitals uh, in consultation with the consultants and the other staff in the uh, units. Uh, so this analysis is very important because through that only we can identify the uh, real reasons, real uh, root causes for the incident which occurred and then through that adequate feedback can be uh, given. So that is very important and also preventive action needs to be taken. So this will be an encouragement to the reporters seeing that there is some improvement occurring due to their reporting. So this sort of a, a sort of action will create an no-blame culture in the hospital and in the ward uh, and the uh, other units. So analyzing is very important, as I mentioned. Uh, the again, analyzing will not find fault with anyone, but will identify the root causes and the preventable factors. And uh, this multidisciplinary team effort is very important. That's why I said the quality management will uh, lies with the uh, consultants and the other staff members uh, in the board to discuss this and uh, uh, discuss this and uh, uh, decide on the factors and the preventive action. So it's very important that everybody gives their fullest support for this action. So uh, I will uh, show you what really needs to be done. This is the near ideal scenario. Like let's say an incident occurs in a ward in a hospital and uh, the ward staff led by the consultant, they attend to the management of the patient and then report the incident to the quality management of the hospital without any delay. Then the quality management unit informs the head of the institution who instructs to further analyze the incident. Then uh, the quality manager, medical officer, he collaborates with the consultant and the board staff and the patient and analyzes this incident and identifies the root causes and based on the findings preventive action is planned and this action is uh, they take action at the board setting to avoid similar incidents occurring in the future and also the incident is discussed at the next clinical meeting of the hospital without mentioning any identifying information are this sort of thing in this ward, this person did this, nothing like that. Only the incident is discussed and that is a very good learning experience for everybody and everybody will be, uh, everybody will uh, try to be more careful in the future to avoid similar incidents. So here nobody was blamed or punished and the reporting led to a learning experience for the uh, entire staff, entire hospital. So this sort of a thing is what we are aiming for, but uh, uh, this is not happening just like that in all the healthcare settings, but this is what we should aim for, and this is what we are expecting to be happening in the hospital. So, uh, so uh, like uh, I mentioned, now incidents do occur. There is no two words about that. Uh, we all know that. Uh, several incidents happen in the healthcare settings, but sometimes, like these are not reported, the causes are not analyzed. This only leads to the incidents occurring repeatedly and more patients facing the same harm because the opportunity is not uh, used for learning from this incident or the error which has occurred in the first instance. So, that is why the importance of having a system for incident and analyze is um, very uh, crucial. And uh, let me show you what we have done as the Ministry of Health, the Directorate of Health, Care, Quality and Safety. Um, this uh, incident reporting uh, mechanism was uh, first started in 2016 as a bill has been issued. And uh, uh, the formats and the guidelines uh, were uh, introduced in 2016. So you can 
see here the initial format. I will uh, just uh, will not discuss further on this because this has been revised subsequently. So uh, this uh, format uh, was the first uh, incident reporting format, which was uh, 16, and this is the uh, incident analyzing form that was issued. Uh, then uh, in 2023, this year, after uh, a lot of uh, uh, consultation, uh, the revised incident reporting and analyzing forms and a set of guidelines for using these forms and the incident uh, reporting process, they were introduced uh, to the hospitals. And at present, uh, these new formats uh, are to be used in the hospital setting. So as intern medical officers, when you come across some incident, uh, please uh, try to report those incidents to the to the quality management unit so that this could be analyzed and um, be used as a learning experience. So this is the circular which gives you uh, the details of the new uh, forms and the guidelines and requesting to uh, carry out uh, this uh, uh, initiative uh, signed by the director of health services. And here you can see the uh, incident uh, reporting form which is uh, the revised version. This is the one which should be used now. So you can see uh, there are two parts, part A and part B. So this part A, this can be actually filled by any healthcare provider. And uh, the basic information about the patient is requested as well as the uh, event which occurred and uh, what sort of action has been taken. So this part B, Part B is to be filled by the head of the units, which would be a consultant, uh, or if there are no consultants, like smaller hospitals, that is like the medical office as well, and the nursing sister maybe. Uh, then in some other units, the chief MLT, pharmacist, radiographer, and so on. So this part is to be filled by the head of the unit, um, and uh, then uh, subsequently sent to the quality management unit of the hospital. So you can see this uh, optional part, actually this was uh, good because uh, uh, some of the hospitals, they gave comments that uh, they were reluctant to go through the head of the unit and mention uh, the, these uh, incidents and report them. So that is why this optional part is mentioned so that they could directly fill the part A and send it to the quality management unit. But uh, the uh, the accurate procedure is for the uh, to fill this part by any healthcare uh, worker, and the second part to be filled by the uh, unit head. And uh, this there is a, a la, uh, the, uh, like an extensive list of incidents mentioned in the overleaf of this uh, form, and uh, you have to uh, mark the. Uh, correct incident out of this list and if uh, it's not mentioned uh, by uh, uh, like if it's not mentioned you can mention it under this other category so uh, this list contains uh, 13 categories actually as you can see uh, also uh, there's uh, medications and then this patient accidents then about the blood products uh, behavior then uh, oxygen gas and vapor Healthcare associated infections, devices and equipment, documentation, and so on. There are so 13 categories, and 14 is the other category. So, out of these, um, you can uh, identify the incident which is uh, which has occurred and then mark it. And then this has to be sent to the quality management unit. So, all the details of the process are mentioned in the uh, guidelines. Uh, provided uh, like uh, developed in uh, line with this uh, forms. So all these documents are available in our uh, directorate website. So you can go through them whenever necessary. So this is the incident analyzing form. This is this will be filled by the quality medical officer or the quality management staff. So they will be liaising with the particular unit or the particular ward to complete this and identify as you can see. So the uh, root cause analysis is here, the recommendations and preventive action, uh, who will be responsibility to take this action and they plan a deadline 
or the name of completion also. So these things are completed by the quality management unit staff. And these are, these are the guidelines which I mentioned. This is also available in our website. Please uh, go through that. Uh, so the, it gives a, a, a very a comprehensive uh, uh, understanding about uh, the how to fill this. These are some of the definitions. So some of these I mentioned. So these are the definitions of different types of uh, uh, like the nomenclature which is used. And here you can see uh, the part one, the part, sorry, part A, the how uh, it should be filled. There's an uh, extensive uh, description about that. And then about the part B, and then uh, the categories of events, uh, which I showed earlier. So they, they have given some examples as well. So like that, there is an extensive document of these guidelines. Please go through that. Uh, right. And the uh, in the annex, uh, we have given the process of handling adverse events. This is the entire process which needs to be followed. And also, a risk matrix is given uh, to identify the uh, serious incident. Uh, so, we have mentioned what needs to be done when it occurred and so on. So, these things are all available in the uh, guidelines. And then uh, Moving on to uh, the other form which I want to discuss. This is the medication incident and error reporting form. Uh, Professor Galapati also showed you this uh, form uh, lecture. So this is actually in addition to the uh, usual incident reporting form for me uh, to uh, identifying the medication error, the burden of medication errors and the importance of uh, preventing them, this form is developed. This was actually um, introduced very recently. Uh, so this is actually uh, a one activity mentioned in the um, National Action Plan on Medication Safety for Sri Lanka, which was developed in 2021. So introducing this medication incident reporting system. So uh, this medication incident reporting form, this is the form uh, has two pages. Uh, so this form also has part A and part B. Uh, again, part A to be uh, filled by any medical uh, uh, personnel. And uh, here you, the patient the patient details need to be included. And then um, asking about uh, did the patient harm occur? That is whether it's a, a real uh, incident or a near miss. And then uh, some description about the event is expected and the location. And uh, the report, and a, uh, the reporter, whether it's uh, the category of uh, staff is requested, but uh, the name of the reporter, if you like, you can mention your name, otherwise you can keep it blank. Then in this part two, this also can be completed by the reporter itself if they are capable of doing it. Or else, this can be sent to the quality management unit where they would liaise with the particular uh, unit because it's mentioned uh, here, and they can complete it as well. So we, uh, this is to identify further information about the medication incidents so that uh, remedial action can be taken. So here, of course, a lot of information is asked about the medication incidents, like the dosage form, then the generic name, or if the name that point, then the strengths, doses, frequency, and things, uh, other than the indications and dates of therapy. In the category of medication errors, so out of these, uh, you can select and mark which category you are of error or incident which occurred, like the wrong medicine, wrong dose, form, strength, frequency, and so on. And then uh, the possible contributory factors. So these can also be marked. One normal factors can be marked, like emergency situation, heavy workload, inexperienced staff, poor quality of editing, poor handwriting, use of application. So like that. And if uh, it's not mentioned here, you can mention it under the other category. And then uh, what was the outcome of the patient if it uh, occurred uh, and uh, if, uh, even if it was a near miss, still what could have been the outcome. And then um, as uh, that was mentioned in the morning, there are different stages of the medication uh, process, like prescribing, transcribing, dispensing, and, and uh, 
uh, monitoring and so on. So each uh, step, uh, in which stage was this um, incident uh, occurred? And also the immediate action or the interventions taken and the preventive actions are um, supposed to be mentioned here. So this form was newly uh, introduced and um, this is also a very uh, important document which you need to uh, fill uh, if a medication incident occurs. And this actually we are as the directorate, we expect all the medication incident reporting forms to be sent to us uh, uh, a copy uh, with the uh, with the uh, through the uh, head of the institution. So that is uh, about this medication incident reporting forms. This is also then part A, part B. So uh, that is about the medication incident reporting form, and uh, that uh, concludes my uh, session about incident reporting. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can ask. And uh, thank you very much, and I wish you all the best for your future. If you have any questions, you can uh, put in the chat box. That seemed to be uh, no questions. Uh, so, then thank you very much and I wish you all the best. Right. Uh... Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Nimali Vijayagunwadar, consultant, community physician, on that uh, detailed lecture on uh, reporting of incidents. Uh, right. Uh, so that comes to conclusion of today's program. So we thank the Directorate of uh, Quality and Safety and the Director, Dr. Damon Ranavira, for organizing, organizing this program along with uh, the coordinating consultant, Dr. Madhavi Ganutilika also, we thank behalf of the Minister of Health and with EMS too. So, uh, so that's today's program. So Monday, please join by uh, 8.45 for uh, second session. All right, thank you. How about the attendance, please? So we have taken attendance from the participants in the Zoom. Okay, so no need to mark, isn't it? No need, yes. Okay, thank you, thank you.